R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 2, Chapters 29-32. through 32. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI Neural Voice. Chapter 29, Matching Wits with Changing Opponents. Precisely two months after the exhausted survivors of the Maryland operations dragged themselves back across the Potomac, they were marching swiftly in long, confident columns to meet the enemy on the Rappahannock. Never, except during the dreadful last retreat to Appomattox, was the army more disorganized than when it returned to Virginia on September 19, 1862. Never, unless after Chancellorsville, was its spirit so high or assured as when it was moving on November 19, 1862, from the hills around Culpeper to the heights at Fredericksburg. It was a recovery in every respect as remarkable as that which in less than three weeks turned the defeated host of Pope into the storming columns that carried McClellan's flags to the walls of the Dunker Church. Perhaps it was a more extraordinary feat when the ability of the North to supply unlimited stores and abounding reserves after Second Manassas is compared with the feeble resources of men and material the Confederacy could command in making good the losses sustained in Maryland. This transformation of his army between Sharpsburg and Fredericksburg was essentially the work of Lee. The measures he took to refit and inspire it anew constitute a lesson that may someday be helpful to the commander of an American army who finds his ranks ragged and depleted after an indecisive battle. Rest, food, refitting, and discipline, that was Lee's prescription. Rest was largely the gift of General McClellan, who was slow to start across the Potomac for a renewal of the campaign. Lee made the most of this adversary's delay. Except for necessary operations in destroying railroads and watching his opponent, he left the infantry as long as he could in untroubled camps. Most of the divisions, with little marching to do, got five full weeks for recuperation in a beautiful country, which was then very dry. Food he procured in an enlarged ration by using nearby mills and by collecting cattle. It was not an easy task. Increasingly, he had to devote his time to commissary duty. Before he left the Blue Ridge for the lower Rappahannock Valley, he received notice from the War Department that provisions were scarce and that a cut in the army ration seemed inevitable. It was the first serious warning of the shortage of food that was ultimately to make near starvation almost as potent a foe as the Army of the Potomac. Refitting was a large undertaking because the army was in tatters, but Lee continued the appeals he made immediately after his return from Maryland. Air-long clothing and blankets in considerable quantities were forwarded to the army. A temporary shortage of arms was reported from Jackson's command, where 3,000 men were without weapons, but this was promptly covered by the issue of captured rifles. As late as the Battle of Fredericksburg, however, a few men were still supplied with smoothbore muskets, which they threw away for the better federal arms they found on that field. The army's greatest lack was shoes and horses. On November 15, more than 6,400 men in Longstreet's command were barefooted and in that condition had to march to Fredericksburg. The shoes that were supplied some of the units were mere strips of untanned hide, stitched crudely together as moccasins and so long that the men could scarcely walk in them. The army mounts, which had seen very hard service, were greatly reduced and in November suffered much from an outbreak of foot and mouth disease. Lee did what he could to conserve them by humane treatment and by the consolidation of small artillery units that used an unnecessary number of animals. He proposed, also, to transfer dismounted cavalrymen to the infantry and to offer cavalry service to foot soldiers who would procure mounts. The War Department was urged to bring horses from Texas, where they were still abundant. The utmost vigilance on Lee's part, and Stuart's success in capturing some 1,200 horses in Pennsylvania in October, scarcely sufficed to keep the wagons rolling and the cavalry in the field. The final exhaustion of the horse supply, which was destined to cripple the army in the winter of 1864-1865, was ominously forecast as early as the autumn of 1862. Lee's disciplinary measures were incident to his effort to increase the army's strength and were of three sorts, the collection of stragglers, recruitment, and reorganization under competent officers. Continuing his efforts to procure stern legislation for dealing with straggler, he had the nearby country combed for them.
J. R. Jones reported from the Shenandoah Valley that he had sent back between 500 and 600 by September 27, and on October 8, Secretary Randolph noted with satisfaction that the strength of the army had increased by 20,000 in eight days. Convalescents were forwarded in considerable numbers. Under the conscription law, the vigorous enforcement of which Lee warmly urged, new recruits were sent in a constant if small stream. These men, however, so generally fell sick that Lee asked the War Department to detain them at camps of instruction until they had passed through the communicable diseases which were then prevalent in the ranks. By October 10, Lee had 64,273 present for duty, by October 20 he could count 68,033, and according to the tri-monthly return of November 10 he had 70,909, though he did not then consider that he had half enough men to resist the enemy on even terms. Besides the consolidation of the weaker artillery companies, which encountered some legal difficulties, Lee's scheme of reorganization involved the division of the cavalry into four brigades. His son Rooney was promoted to the command of one of these, with the rank of brigade general. Another step in reorganization was the choice of the better qualified officers for the commands that had lost their leaders, though little progress was made in applying the new law Congress had passed for the demotion of incompetent officers. A vigorous effort was made, at the same time, to strengthen the Texas units, which had now become Lee's favorite shock troops. The most important step in reorganization was the division of the armies into two corps, the first under Longstreet and the second under Jackson. Congress had passed an act providing for the appointment of lieutenant generals, and Davis had written for recommendations. Lee unhesitatingly endorsed Longstreet. In advocating like rank for Jackson, Lee employed language which records the final dissipation of all his doubts as to Stonewall's willingness to cooperate. Lee said, My opinion of the merits of General Jackson has been greatly enhanced during this expedition. He is true, honest and brave, has a single eye to the good of the service, and spares no exertion to accomplish his object. The formal announcement of these promotions was not made until November 6. Had Lee thought it necessary to divide the army into three corps, he would have recommended the promotion of A. P. Hill, whom he ranked next after Longstreet and Jackson. Lee sometimes confided to his staff officers that he wished some capable brigadier headed a division commanded by a mediocre major general, but in this instance he declined to recommend promotions for the vacated places of the new lieutenant generals. I believe you have sufficient names before you, he told the president, to fill the vacancies. Your own knowledge of the claims and qualifications of the officers will, I feel assured, enable you to make the best selection. This was dangerous deference, for the responsibility would rest on Lee and the price might be the lives of hundreds of men if the president erred in his choice. Lee probably refrained because he knew the embarrassments of the president at the time. A growing jealousy of the Virginia generals was being voiced by those who felt that the soldiers of the Old Dominion were being unduly advanced. There was much insistence on recognizing the different states in the distribution of military honors. Politicians of a certain stamp put residents above merit. Graduates of the United States Military Academy, also, were regarded with disfavor by some ardent patriots who had no military education. Such were Lee's methods in refitting and reorganizing the army for the next struggle. It was a work he had been called upon to perform after the seven days, a work to which he had to give himself at the close of nearly all his subsequent campaigns. While he labored in this manner to raise the efficiency of his forces, two other influences, very different in their nature, operated on individual soldiers. By proclamation of September 23, President Lincoln announced that he would emancipate on January 1, 1863, all slaves in districts where the people were in rebellion against the United States. This confirmed the belief of Southerners that the election of Lincoln was a conspiracy against the Constitution. A new sense of justification showed itself in the resistance of the South. A little later there began in the army a revival of religion that spread from division to division for more than a year. This improved discipline and helped to give the army the quality that Cromwell desired when he said he wanted only such men as made some conscience of what they did. Straggling ceased altogether. By October 12th, an observant officer could write, Our army is in splendid condition. It had been rapidly increasing during the last three weeks by conscripts and convalescents who have been coming in.
If the enemy cross the Potomac to begin the offensive, we shall, I think, have another great battle, and I feel sure that it will be a splendid victory for us. At headquarters, Major Walter Taylor echoed the same opinion. Colonel Garnet Wolseley, later Field Marshal Lord Wolseley of the British Army, who visited Lee at this time, observed no signs of demoralization. I never saw an army, he wrote after he left, composed of finer men, or that looked more like work than that portion of General Lee's army which I was fortunate enough to see inspected. As for Lee, he spoke, Wolseley attested, as a man proud of his country, and confident of ultimate success under the blessings of the Almighty, whom he glorified for past successes, and who made he invoked for all future operations. It may have been Wolseley whose face betrayed some surprise when he saw how ragged were the breeches of Hood's men after their first files had passed in review. Never mind the raggedness, Colonel, Lee said quietly, the enemy never sees the backs of my Texans. The first stages of the reorganization were passed while Lee was still handicapped by the injury he had received on August 31. All his correspondence had to be conducted with one or another of his staff officers as amanuensis. It was not until approximately October 12 that he was able to dress and undress himself with his left hand and, with his right, to sign his name. Trying as were the times, and hard as were his duties, he did not forget the amenities. There was a note of regret in his reference to the death of his old engineering comrade, General Mansfield, his superior officer more than thirty years before at Cockspur Island, who had been killed at Sharpsburg. When General Kenny's widow applied for the mount and horse furnishings that had been captured when that gallant Federal had fallen at Ox Hill, Lee had them appraised, paid for them himself, and sent them to Mrs. Kearney, pending adjustment by the War Department. The last days of his convalescence were brightened by a visit from Custis, who came from Richmond to see him, but within a few weeks he was dealt a personal blow far worse than a physical injury. His second daughter, Annie, had gone to the Warren White Sulphur Spring, North Carolina, and had been stricken ill there. On October 20, she died. Lee had known of her illness and had been most apprehensive, but he was not prepared for her death when he received the announcement of it. After he got the letter, he pulled himself together and went over the official correspondence of the morning in Major Taylor's company without revealing his loss or showing his emotion. After Major Taylor left, he took out the letter again and as he read its pathetic details of the passing of the girl, she was only twenty-three, he could no longer repress his grief. When Taylor unceremoniously re-entered the tent a few minutes later, Lee was weeping. As soon as he could control himself, he sent word to his sons in the army. I cannot express the anguish I feel at the death of my sweet Annie, he wrote Mrs. Lee. To know that I shall never see her again on earth, that her place in our circle, which I always hoped one day to enjoy, is forever vacant, is agonizing in the extreme. But God in this, as in all things, has mingled mercy with the blow, in selecting that one best prepared to leave us. May you be able to join me in saying, His will be done. To his brother, Charles Carter Lee, he wrote in the same spirit. God has taken, he said, the purest and best, but his will be done. His grief hung long and heavily upon him. From Fredericksburg, the next month, when every day threatened battle, he wrote to his daughter, Mary, in the quiet hours of the night, when there is nothing to lighten the full weight of my grief, I feel as if I should be overwhelmed. I have always counted, if God should spare me a few days after the Civil War was ended, that I should have her with me, but year after year my hopes go out, and I must be resigned. Meantime, the tragedy was shaping itself again to a bloody climax. Lee knew too well the weakness of Harper's Ferry to attempt to hold it. On September 22, it was occupied by Sumner's Corps. Anticipating no early attack from this vanguard, Lee set a large force to work destroying 20 miles of the track of the Baltimore and Ohio west of the town. While maintaining his own line of communications down the Shenandoah Valley by means of his wagons, he proceeded, also, to break up the railway between Harper's Ferry and Winchester so as to retard an advance by the enemy in that direction. Before the wrecking of the Baltimore and Ohio was well underway, he retired with the greater part of the army a few miles higher up the Valley Pike, with his left at Bunker Hill and his right near Winchester. His headquarters were established at Falling Waters. Federal activity in North Carolina and signs of an advance from Norfolk up the south side of the James River about this time created some alarm in Richmond and led to an agitation for the return of the Army of Northern Virginia.
Lee was not unmindful of the safety of the capital, but he believed that McClellan's first advance would be toward the Virginia Central Railroad, which he thought he could protect by maneuvering on the flank of the enemy. However, in order to ascertain what the enemy was doing and at the same time to delay and demoralize him, he ordered Stuart on October 8 to undertake a cavalry raid into Maryland and Pennsylvania. He outlined Stuart's route in some detail and set the destruction of the bridge over the Concochig at Chambersburg as his main object. If this could be done, the Cumberland Valley Railroad would be cut and McClellan would be forced to bring up his supplies over the Baltimore and Ohio westward from Baltimore. Stuart left camp with 1,800 men and four guns on October 9, crossed the Potomac at McCoy's Ford, between Williamsport and Hancock, on the morning of October 10, reached Chambersburg, Penna, that night, and sent a detachment to destroy the bridge. Unfortunately, the structure was found to be of iron and defied the wreckers. Riding fast from Chambersburg to escape the Federal cavalry, Stuart passed through Emmitsburg and Hyattstown and recrossed the Potomac at White's Ferry, near Poolsville, on the morning of October 12. He brought off 1,200 horses, leaving 60 of his own jaded mounts on the road, and escorted into the Confederate lines some 30 Federal officeholders as hostages. In 27 hours he had covered 80 miles with no casualties except one man wounded and two missing. The Federal cavalry that followed him lost nearly half their men from straggling and were useless for days as a result of their mad riding. Stuart's observations on this Chambersburg raid convinced Lee that McClellan was not withdrawing troops eastward, but Lee did not interpret this to mean that the Army of the Potomac had abandoned all hope of moving on the Confederate capital. Although he considered that Richmond was in no immediate danger, he believed that if McClellan found it impossible to advance southward to the Virginia Central Railroad, he would later move against Richmond from the south side of the James. Meantime, the longer the Army of Northern Virginia could delay the enemy on the frontier, the shorter the period McClellan would have for field operations. This last consideration became the major factor in Lee's plan of campaign. Whatever was done and whatever had to be risked, Lee reasoned that he must fight for time. A junction with his ally, Winter, was his main objective. Temporarily, to create a diversion and to interrupt McClellan's communications with the West, he had considered an advance by luring from the Kanawha Valley to the line of the Baltimore and Ohio, but lateness of the season and a threat by the enemy in the Kanawha district compelled him to forego this. On October 16 word reached headquarters that a mixed federal force of some size had crossed the Potomac and was making its way southwestward from Shepherdstown toward the Confederate front. Lee hoped that if McClellan were advancing, he would move up the valley of the Shenandoah, but his reports during the day favored the view that McClellan was merely feeling out the Confederate lines in force. Stuart opposed the enemy's progress and fell slowly back before him. To strengthen Stuart against eventualities, a P. Hill was ordered in support. Early in the morning of the 17th, when couriers reported the enemy still advancing on the road that led from Kennysville on the Baltimore and Ohio to Smithfield, Lee issued precautionary orders and rode out in person to examine the situation. Finding the division commanders on the alert and the enemy hesitant in his movements, he did not linger long at the front. With a few staff officers and couriers, he rode back toward headquarters. Ten minutes after he crossed the Kennysville-Smithfield Road, a small federal scouting party galloped by on its way to Smithfield. It was Lee's closest call since the August morning when he had met a similar federal cavalcade near Salem on his march to join Jackson at Groveton. Before the day was over, the enemy returned the way he had come. The alarm was passed for the time, and the army settled down once more to await McClellan's next move. Convinced that the blow would fall soon, Lee made his preparations with care. He ordered the routes through the Blue Ridge examined, and on October 22 he directed General J. G. Walker to take his division eastward over the mountains to Upperville to check raids in that district and to observe the enemy. Stuart was directed to place cavalry on the eastern flank of Walker, and Colonel John R. Chambliss, commanding a small cavalry force around Fredericksburg, was told to connect his pickets with those of Walker. In this way Lee put a screen between himself and the enemy all the way from Martinsburg to Fredericksburg, a distance of approximately 95 miles. Four days passed. Then, on October 26, the outposts reported that the Federal Army was crossing the Potomac, apparently in full strength. 
More than a month had been gained, the grey regiments were rested and ready, and Lee, though conscious of the odds, faced his old antagonist with steadfast heart. On the very day of McClellan's crossing he wrote his brother, I am glad you derive satisfaction from the operations of the army. I acknowledge nothing can surpass the valor and endurance of our troops, yet while so much remains to be done, I feel as if nothing had been accomplished. But we must endure to the end, and if our people are true to themselves and our soldiers continue to discard all thoughts of self and to press nobly forward in defense alone of their country and their rights, I have no fear of the result. We may be annihilated, but we cannot be conquered. No sooner is one army scattered than another rises up. This snatches from us the fruits of victory and covers the battlefields with our dead. Yet what have we to live for if not victorious? In this spirit, Lee once more asked himself the vexing old question, what will the enemy do? McClellan had two routes of immediate advance open to him. First, he could move southward down the Shenandoah Valley toward Staunton. By holding all the gaps of the Blue Ridge this would be a reasonably safe move, but it involved the maintenance of lengthy communication by wagon train. Further, as Jackson had demonstrated, the Shenandoah Valley afforded excellent ground for strategic defensive maneuver, especially in the vicinity of the Massanutten Mountain. The other route open to McClellan was Pope's Old Road east of the Blue Ridge, with Gordonsville and the seizure of the Virginia Central Railroad as the first objectives. This line was much less protected than that of the Shenandoah Valley, but it had the great advantage of offering railway communication via the Orange and Alexandria Railway. The two routes appear on the accompanying sketch. From the time of his return to Virginia after the Maryland expedition, Lee had hoped that McClellan would enter the Shenandoah Valley, but he considered it more likely his foe would move southward on the east side of the Blue Ridge, and he had to provide for either contingency. He did so without delay. On October 28, he ordered the army divided. Jackson was to withdraw a few miles up the valley to the road from Berryville to Charlestown, where he would have better forage and would be nearer the passes of the Blue Ridge. Semi-independent command was given Stonewall, with instructions to act at discretion when he could not readily communicate with Army headquarters. Longstreet was to march for Culpeper, accompanying Lee. The two corps were to keep in touch with each other, so that they could be united on either side of the Blue Ridge as McClellan's movements might require. If the enemy advanced up the valley in force, Jackson was to delay him, retire before him, and then make for the gaps through which, if necessary, he might form junction with Longstreet. In case the enemy marched southward east of the mountains and gave him an opening, Jackson was to move on the rear of the Unionists and cut their communications. Longstreet was to defend the direct line of advance east of the Blue Ridge. The cavalry was to be divided between the corps, and one brigade was to operate on the flank and in front of McClellan. At this stage of his preparations Lee was called to Richmond, which he had not visited since he had left on August 14 to join Jackson at Gordonsville. The reason for the summons was the desire of the president to discuss with him the size of the reinforcements that could be sent Lee from southern Virginia and eastern North Carolina, where some believed the enemy had abandoned all thought of an early offensive. The question was a delicate one, for opinion as to the intentions of the federal garrisons on the coast was divided. Lee was in Richmond on November 1 and conferred with the President and General S. G. French, who was in immediate command of the threatened area. At the Grey House, Lee asked French what was the least number of men he would require to hold his line for a short time. After reflecting, French said 6,000. That's reasonable, Lee answered. When you return, order all above that number to report to me. French remembered this as an example of Lee's consideration in not strengthening his army at the expense of other officers charged with the heavy responsibility. By November 6, Lee was back at Culpeper, where he established his headquarters in a pine thicket. He found the situation developing fast. The enemy was advancing with some vigor between the Blue Ridge and the Orange and Alexandria Railroad and was holding all the passes on his right flank and in rear of his right. It seemed for the time as if McClellan were seeking to interpose between Jackson and Longstreet, though Lee did not believe his cautious antagonist would venture far southward on the eastern side of the mountains, so long as Jackson remained potentially on his flank. Neither did he believe McClellan would try to descend on Jackson unless he felt able to make an overwhelming detachment of force for that purpose. His first hope was to turn McClellan's columns near the Blue Ridge. 
Concluding that this was not possible, he suggested to Jackson that he move up the valley so that he could quickly unite with Longstreet through Swift Run Gap in case of emergency. Lee learned on the 7th that the advance of the enemy had reached Warrington and that his cavalry was on the Rappahannock. During the next few days he was apprised of the arrival of further units around Warrington. The cavalry was active, and there were some indications that the enemy, after all, might be planning to march into the Shenandoah Valley, in which case Lee intended to throw Longstreet against his line of communications. But nothing happened. To the surprise of many, the general advance stopped. On the 10th, within 24 hours after the reason for this halt became known to the Army of the Potomac, it was reported to Lee, McClellan had been superseded on the 7th by Major General Ambrose E. Burnside and on the 9th had transferred command. The news was received by the Confederates, with regrets and rejoicings curiously mingled. Lee was sorry that his old associate of the Mexican War was no longer to oppose him. We always understood each other so well, he said to Longstreet. I fear they may continue to make these changes till they find someone whom I don't understand. He was sorry, too, that a man who had always conducted operations with science and humanity was supplanted by one whose respect for principle he had no means of determining until Burnside should begin field operations. Longstreet was glad of the change because he thought McClellan was developing as a general and, if left in command, would have given the Army of Northern Virginia no further breathing spell. Others reasoned that the change was to the advantage of the South, since Burnside was regarded as less able than Little Mac. Some of the officers of the army insisted that the removal of McClellan would demoralize the troops of his former command, who had held him in high esteem, a feeling that was echoed in Warrenton by many of the retiring leader's old lieutenants. McClellan left to return no more. Lee did not cross swords with him thereafter and never saw him again. To the last maneuver, in this final phase of McClellan's operations, Lee had reasoned rightly as to his opponent's intentions. Just as Lee had believed, McClellan had moved southward in the hope of striking at Gordonsville. If that proved impossible, McClellan's plan was to shift to Fredericksburg and to advance on Richmond by that line or preferably to move the army by sea to James River. McClellan had not been confident that his proposed advance on Gordonsville was practicable. His partial success at Sharpsburg had not lessened his secret feeling of inferiority to Lee, whose strength he overestimated in November as in June. Even as stout a soldier as George Gordon Meade had not been hopeful of outmaneuvering the Confederates. They are so skillful in strategy, he bluntly confessed. Besides, Meade did not believe that the Orange and Alexandria Railroad could handle more than one-third of the supplies the army would require. On November 12, Lee began to suspect that the change of commanders would involve a change of plan. Although the only definite evidence he had of this was the failure of the Federals to move southward, he thought it likely that the enemy might turn down the Rappahannock to Fredericksburg. He sent warning to Jackson that such a move might require his immediate junction with Longstreet and he told him to be prepared to start on a moment's notice. The next day Stuart reported that the enemy seemed to be moving his right flank away from the mountains. Elsewhere there was no activity, but the Federal cavalry outposts were found along the Rappahannock River. The morning of the 14th brought no new developments, yet Lee was more than ever inclined to think the enemy's advance was down the river toward deep water and the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac Railroad. Again he warned Stonewall that he must soon be ready to start over the mountains. We will endeavor to confuse and confound the enemy as much as our circumstances will permit, he told Jackson. Lee had at that time one regiment of cavalry, four companies of Mississippi infantry, and a battery at Fredericksburg, and he now ordered the commanding officer there to destroy the railroad between the Point and Aquia, where the Federals had a landing place directly off the Potomac. On the 15th, hearing that the enemy was beginning to move from Warrenton toward the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, Lee directed a second battery and a regiment of infantry to the Rappahannock town. Another day of suspense passed. Then, on the 17th, there were doubts in his mind for a few hours whether or not Fredericksburg was the enemy's goal, but while he weighed evidence and argued probabilities, scouts reported that three brigades of the Union infantry were moving against the city and that several federal transports and gunboats had entered Aquia Creek. This virtually decided the question in Lee's mind.
he gave orders for one division of Longstreet's corps to take the road toward Fredericksburg, and he determined to send the rest of the corps after it the next morning if the news of the Federal March was confirmed. Jeb Stuart undertook a force reconnaissance across the Rappahannock on the 18th to see if the enemy had left Warrington. Jackson was advised to move at least a part of the Second Corps to the mountains, preparatory to rejoining the main army. The leading division of Longstreet's command was ordered to continue its march toward Fredericksburg. The reserve artillery also was put on the road. It was a day of immense activity in the camps and at headquarters. Lee had no desire to make a stand on the south bank of the Rappahannock at Fredericksburg. The position had no depth and was dominated by the heights on the north bank, which the enemy was certain to occupy. The federal line of communications was short. Strategically, it was far preferable to withdraw to the line of the North Anna, where the enemy's communications would be more extended and where, as Lee then believed, the nature of the ground would make a counterstroke possible. It was with this object in view that he ordered a division of Longstreet's corps, early on the 18th, to make for the North Anna. But during the day of the 18th one of his spies reported that the force advancing toward Fredericksburg consisted of Sumner's corps only. Lee decided that if no other force were moving to Fredericksburg he should endeavor to hold Sumner on the line of the Rappahannock until Burnside's purpose was disclosed. It might even be possible to surprise Sumner in an attempt to cross the river. The prudence of standing on the Rappahannock seemed the stronger when Jackson reported some movements of the enemy that suggested a possible advance from Harper's Ferry up the Shenandoah Valley. Most particularly, Lee decided to oppose Burnside on the Rappahannock because he could not afford to lose the supplies in the lower valley of that river or to open to the enemy territory south of Fredericksburg which the Federals had not previously pillaged. For these reasons, the division that had been ordered to the North Anna was directed temporarily to take position midway between that river and Fredericksburg. The rest of Longstreet's corps was ordered to move for Fredericksburg on the 19th. The same day Lee broke up his headquarters at Culpeper and started to the new scene of action, confident that the enemy was preparing to advance via Fredericksburg on Richmond. At the instance of Jackson, who was hoping for the opportunity of a counterstroke in the valley, Lee did not issue peremptory orders for the Second Corps to rejoin immediately, but he again cautioned Jackson to put himself in position to reinforce Longstreet whenever ordered to do so. Jackson's correspondence is missing from the official records, and consequently it is not possible to say with assurance why he was so anxious to remain far down the Shenandoah Valley near Winchester in the face of Lee's repeated suggestions that he should retire up the valley and rejoin the army. Apparently Jackson hoped that he might be able to repeat the maneuver of 2nd Manassas and to get in rear of the enemy. Lee had considered this possibility. Although he does not seem to have put great faith in it, he had withheld positive orders as long as possible. He was now beginning to shape a plan whereby Jackson would lay off the enemy's flank near Culpeper and discourage a southward move across the Rappahannock. As Lee rode toward Fredericksburg, through the gloomy wilderness of Spotsylvania that was to be the scene of some of his bloodiest fighting, Burnside was hurrying his troops found by the roads on the opposite side of the Rappahannock. Lee, in fact, had anticipated the movements of his new opponent with a precision that was almost prescience. The transfer of Longstreet from Richmond to Gordonsville, while McClellan was preparing to reinforce Pope, was scarcely more remarkable. On the very day that Lee had first suspected the Army of the Potomac might shift by the left flank to Fredericksburg, General Burnside had been stubbornly arguing for such an advance in the face of the opposition of General Halleck, who had come to headquarters at Warrenton for a conference. On the 14th, when Lee had been strengthened in his belief that Fredericksburg was the enemy's objective, Burnside had been authorized to advance thither, the first units of Sumner's Corps had started for Fredericksburg on the 15th, the very day on which Lee ordered the first small reinforcement there. With all the advantage that the initiative normally offers, the Federals had a start of only one day. Chapter 30, Two Signal Guns and Long Suspense the gracious little city of Fredericksburg, to which Lee came through a rising storm on November 20, is among the fairest and most ancient of Virginia. Lying at the fall line, it had been settled before the end of the 17th century. Across from it George Washington had spent his boyhood, and in a simple house on one of its shaded streets his mother had breathed her last. Paul Jones had climbed its hills. Hugh Mercer had practiced physic on its kindly folk. From the Fitzhugh Mansion at Chatham, Lee himself in youth had looked upon its gardens.
along the river, among the shops and warehouses, lived humble people, terraced above them were the seats of the socially mighty, still higher, ranged along the western hills that sheltered the town, were a few great homes, proud and separate in the architecture of Jefferson. Aristocrats who remembered the revolution had built these fine houses, had covered handsome panels with old portraits, and had stored deep cellars with comforting Madeira. Their leisured sons had grown grey reading their father's books and holding fast to their politics and their religion. It was a place of respected names and long memories, of tinkling church bells and of children's laughter, proud, brave, patriotic. As Lee saw it through a rain that had whipped the last of the leaves from the oaks and maples, his eye swept swiftly over its beauties to the Stafford Heights. There they were, the encampments and the fires of the enemy, the batteries and the hurrying dispatch bearers. A demonstration, which the Confederates had taken for an attempt to force a crossing, had been made on the 17th, but otherwise the enemy had been content to await reinforcements. Scarcely had Lee made his preliminary dispositions on the 21st, with the storm still raging, than a flag of truce from the mayor of the town was reported on the river front. The flag came from Brigadier General M. R. Patrick, commanding General Burnside's provost guard, and was delivered to Lee. In a letter, General E. V. Sumner, commanding the right grand division of the Army of the Potomac, demanded the surrender of Fredericksburg on the grounds that his troops had been fired upon from the streets, while the manufactories had been used to assist the Confederate cause. Capitulation was demanded by 5 p.m. that day, under penalty of a bombardment at 9 a.m. on the 22 d. Lee was determined, of course, to protect the civilian population of Fredericksburg. At the same time, he could not afford to have the place occupied by the enemy, nor could his batteries in rear of the town prevent a bombardment by the long-range Federal artillery across the Rappahannock. To save the town from destruction, if possible, Lee informed Mayor Slaughter that he would not occupy Fredericksburg or use its factories, though he could not consent to an occupation by the enemy. The mayor immediately dispatched General Sumner a letter of dignity and candor, telling him what Lee had said and reminding him that it was impossible to remove the non-combatant population within the time limit, which was only 16 hours from the moment of writing. Later in the evening, Lee was told that Sumner had notified the mayor that he would accept the assurances given him and would not begin to shell the town the next morning. Beyond that he made no promise, except to say that General Patrick would meet at Chatham a delegation from Fredericksburg the next day at nine o'clock. Welcome as was this reprieve to the defenseless townspeople, Lee felt that a collision was likely at any time and that the non-combatants would inevitably suffer if they remained where they were. With a heavy heart, he had to advise them to evacuate the town as promptly as possible. Although the storm was still at its height, the brave women and the old men accepted his advice without a murmur. That night and the next morning a long, dolorous procession moved out from Fredericksburg. Those who possessed means and had friends to the southward took the train, which the enemy shelled, the less fortunate had to seek shelter in the woods and farmhouses behind the Confederate lines. Old family carriages were hitched to aged, lame, and blind horses, by Lee's orders the wagons and ambulances of the army were placed at the disposal of those who had no conveyances, the outraged soldiers shared their poor rations with the hungry. Many of the civilians had neither food, transport, nor protection against the rain of November 22. Not a few mothers were seen, wearily carrying infants, while older children walked at their side through the mud and over frozen ground. Yet such was their spirit that when these women met soldiers, they often greeted them, not with tears or hysterical appeals for succor, but with a stout-hearted, God bless you. As Lee met these brave townsfolk his admiration rose. One little group of children that he saw from the roadside he had his troopers take on their horses and carry to a place of safety. Months later, when he was writing his report, he echoed the tribute expressed in the letters written at the time. History, said he, presents no instance of a people exhibiting a purer and more unselfish patriotism or a higher spirit of fortitude and courage than was evinced by the citizens of Fredericksburg. They cheerfully incurred great hardships and privations, and surrendered their homes and property to destruction rather than yield them into the hands of the enemies of their country. The Federals themselves must have been touched by the fortitude and suffering of the women and children, for at a conference held on the afternoon of the 22d, General Sumner gave written guarantee that as long as no hostile demonstrations were made from Fredericksburg the town would not be shelled. Before many days were passed, some of the shivering people imprudently crept back to their desolate homes and remained there even when walls were toppling and the streets were fire-swept.
When no advance followed the threatened bombardment of Fredericksburg, Lee was puzzled. The rebuilding of the wharfs at Aquia Creek seemed to indicate that Burnside intended to use that admirable landing as a base for an advance on Richmond, but there remained a possibility that he might be screening a movement southward to the James. Lee had to shape his defense for either eventuality and had at the same time to hold to the major plan he had adopted against McClellan after Sharpsburg, that of delaying the enemy until the winter halted his advance. His dispositions were characteristic. General G. W. Smith at Richmond was told of the possibility of an advance to the James and was directed to make every possible effort to discover the plan of the Federals at Norfolk. A battalion of the reserve artillery, under Major John W. Moore, was ordered to Richmond to strengthen the city's defenses, but on second thought was directed to go to the North Anna, where it could defend from a cavalry raid the principal bridge on Lee's line of communications, which was now established by way of the Richmond and Fredericksburg Railroad. If no raid was threatened, this artillery, of course, could be moved in a day either to Richmond or to Fredericksburg. The most important orders that Lee issued, when he found that Burnside did not follow up his threat to bombard Fredericksburg, were directed to Jackson. Lee at this time had with him less than 31,000 infantry, about 1,300 artillerymen, and approximately 7,000 cavalry. He assumed he had in front of him, or marching through the autumn fields toward Stafford Heights, virtually the whole Army of the Potomac, fully three times his numbers. Anxious as he was to strengthen himself against these odds by calling up Jackson's 34,000, Lee concluded that for a short time at least Jackson might be of more use to him on the enemy's flank than in the Shenandoah Valley or across the Rappahannock from Burnside. He reviewed the situation in a dispatch he wrote Jackson on November 23, and at the end of it he indicated a paragraph that perfectly illustrates the relations between the two men and the faith Lee now imposed in the discretion of Jackson. Lee said, under this view of things, if correct, I do not see, at this distance, what military effect can be produced by the continuance of your corps in the valley. If it were east of the Blue Ridge, either in Loudoun, Fouquier or Culpeper, its influence would be felt by the enemy whose rear would be threatened, though they might feel safe with regard to their communications. Another advantage would be, provided you were at Culpeper, that you would be in railroad communication with several points, so that the transfer of your troops would be rendered certain, without regard to the state of the weather or the condition of the roads. If, therefore, you see no way of making an impression on the enemy from where you are, and concur with me in the views I have expressed, I wish you would move east of the Blue Ridge, and take such a position as you may find best. In a word, Lee held to his previous belief that with Jackson at Culpeper, Burnside would hesitate to make any general advance or to detach large forces for operations elsewhere. Even in this belief, he left that move to the discretion of Jackson and, at the same time, had so much confidence in the fighting qualities of Longstreet's corps and in the strength of its position that he was willing to keep the army divided a few days longer and to face the Army of the Potomac with less than 40,000 men. By November 23, Jackson was on the march from the vicinity of Winchester. Burnside remained mysteriously quiet and even drew back slightly from the Rappahannock. This created some new doubt in Lee's mind as to whether his adversary was not covering a transfer of troops south of the James, but he felt that the Army of the Potomac by this time was so definitely committed to the line of the Rappahannock that a further change of base would be regarded in the North as equivalent to a defeat. I think, therefore, he said, he will persevere in his present course, and the longer we can delay him and throw him into the winter, the more difficult will be his undertaking. The probability of a general offensive on the Rappahannock increased as three days, four days, five days passed, and with it grew the desirability of uniting the army. Still Lee had faith in the advantage of holding Jackson on Burnside's flank. It was not until he found that the next storm would probably make the roads almost impassable and would cause a march on Culpeper to be inhumanly severe on Jackson's men that he finally, on November 27, abandoned his plan of keeping the Second Corps on the right of Burnside's army and definitely urged Jackson to move to Fredericksburg and take position close to Longstreet. Even then he left the advance to the discretion of Stonewall. On the evening of November 29, while the snow was falling heavily outside his headquarters tent at Hamilton's Crossing, Lee heard some commotion and, on going out, saw the familiar figure of Jackson, who had ridden ahead with one aide to report the advance of his corps. Lee greeted his incomparable lieutenant warmly and after a friendly exchange of good wishes, gave him and his companions supper and then confirmed the directions he had already issued that Jackson place his corps to the right and rear of Longstreet.
for Lee was beginning to suspect that Burnside would not dare assault the strong position directly at Fredericksburg and that, if the Federals crossed the Rappahannock at all in that vicinity, it would be below the city. For this reason he ordered Jackson to establish himself on the Richmond and Fredericksburg Railroad around Guinea Station whence he could easily move to support Longstreet, to extend the right, or to face an advance from farther down the Rappahannock. In accordance with these directions Jackson's troops began to take their position on December 1st. Many of them had marched 175 miles in 12 days, and though some were barefooted, the physical condition of the whole corps was good and its spirit was high. Their commander did not like his new position and protested against it to Lee. We will whip the enemy, Jackson told D. H. Hill, but gain no fruits of victory. D. H. Hill himself was sent as far down the Rappahannock as Port Royal. Lee felt that he should protect a wide front, but he was fully conscious of the tactical limitations of the position at Fredericksburg and, it will be recalled, had first planned to make his stand against Burnside on the North Anna. Now, in addition to the earlier considerations that had decided him to stand on the line of the Rappahannock, others had arisen. The government at Richmond was concerned over federal preparations that seemed to indicate a new offensive in the South, and General G. W. Smith, commanding at Richmond, was more apprehensive than ever of a federal advance up the south side of the James. Lee was willing to withdraw nearer to the capital when the president thought such a move necessary, yet he felt that a retreat from the Rappahannock would bring the enemy close to Richmond where a further federal concentration might be effected, and he knew that such a movement would cost the Confederacy the supplies he was then drawing from the lower valley of the Rappahannock. He urged that troops from the south be brought to Richmond, if possible, and that Smith, if attacked, make the best defense he could. In case of emergency he could march to Smith's support. Meantime, he told Smith, I think it important to keep Burnside at a distance from Richmond as long as possible even if that of necessity involved a battle where a victory could not be followed up. Fortunately, Lee's intelligence service was now working admirably even better than when Burnside, at Warrenton, had frankly told the War Department that Lee's means of getting information were far superior to his. Confederate spies were on both flanks of Burnside's army north of the Rappahannock and on the Potomac as well. Another spy had visited the North and had returned with an excellent budget of information. The federal newspapers, which Lee read assiduously, afforded much of high value. Three days after the arrival of the pontoons by which Burnside intended to cross the Rappahannock, Lee was apprised of the fact. Assured that he would be notified of any movement of consequence, Lee made the best of the time allowed him by Burnside's unexpected delay. I tremble for my country, he said, when I hear of confidence expressed in me. I know too well my weakness, and that our only hope is in God. But there was not lacking in his preparations the calm poise of a man who relied on his own military judgment and on the valor of his army. On the hills around Fredericksburg the reorganization begun after Sharpsburg was completed. Regiments were shifted, Lee's proposal to place in the infantry ranks those cavalrymen who had lost their mounts was at length approved, an incompetent general was tactfully disposed of, and another was sent back to seek command elsewhere, pleasant relations were established with the new Secretary of War, James A. Sutton, who on November 15 had succeeded Randolph on the resignation of the latter. When Captain A. P. Mason left him to rejoin General Johnston, Major Walter H. Taylor was formally named acting assistant adjutant general in his place. Refitting went on, despite a threatened breakdown of the railroad to Richmond. Provision was made for recasting the smaller guns into 12-pounder Napoleons, arms were provided for Jackson's convalescence, shoes were somehow found for those stalwarts who required footgear larger than the government issued, further supplies of warm clothing were issued for at least some of the men. The fine spirit of the army mounted higher and higher, the men began to indulge in snowball battles for lack of more serious hostilities and, as one pious brigadier remarked, their nature seemed so changed that they bore in patience what they once would have regarded as beyond human endurance. Active preparations for the inevitable battle went on apace, in weather that made war impartially against the armies. On the hills back of Fredericksburg, artillery positions were chosen and the ranges set. Possible crossing places below Fredericksburg were examined, some troublesome gunboats in the vicinity of Port Royal were driven off, cavalry reconnaissances to feel out the enemy were safely conducted, the railroad from Fredericksburg to Hamilton's crossing was torn up, and absentees were brought into the ranks until, on December 10, Lee had 78,511 men with the colors.
Only two things were left undone, so far as Lee could direct, the army continued on a long, sprawling front of 20 miles, from Fredericksburg to Port Royal, unconcentrated, and, secondly, to the surprise of some officers, only a few earthworks were thrown up. These seeming omissions were undoubtedly deliberate. The occupation of the Port Royal sector seemed necessary to prevent a turning movement that would give the enemy an easy line of advance on Richmond. The position directly at Fredericksburg was so strong that elaborate fortifications would have convinced any antagonist that it was impregnable, especially if the whole army of Northern Virginia had crowded the heights above the intrepid little town. It doubtless was better, in Lee's opinion, to invite attack by seeming negligence than to discourage it by a show of complete preparation. Ten dark December days passed. Headquarters labored to meet the attack when it should come. Axes rang ceaselessly in the woods as the soldiers chopped firewood to keep from freezing. The night of December 10 arrived and a rumor spread through some of the camps that a southern woman had crept down to the river bank that evening and had called across to the shivering gray pickets that the Federals had received a large issue of rations with orders to cook them at once. The Confederate in the ranks had learned to read the signs of operations that close-mouthed officers sought to keep secret, and he knew that the cooking of extra rations almost invariably meant an army movement on the morrow. Would the attack come with the dawn? Was Burnside about to pass the river and challenge the confident army of Northern Virginia on the heights? At every campfire, the questions were argued. They doubtless were still vaguely ranging in the sleeping minds of the soldiers when, about 4.45 o'clock on the morning of December 11, there came from Mary's Heights, behind the town, the roar of a cannon, then of another, and then silence. Two guns, signal guns, the agreed warning that the enemy was attempting to force a crossing of the Rappahannock. Chapter 31, It is Well That War Is So Terrible Fredericksburg By the dim light of a half-obscured moon at two o'clock on the morning of December 11, through a rising haze the Confederate pickets in Fredericksburg had observed the first preparations of the Federal engineers to throw their pontoons across the Rappahannock. Word had reached General McClaws about 4.30 that General William Barksdale, who commanded in the town, would open fire as soon as the pontoneers were within easy range. A few minutes later McClaws sent a courier to General Lee and ordered Captain J. W. Reed's battery of reserve artillery to fire the signal guns. As Lee rode forward from his headquarters at Hamilton's Crossing, in answer to McClaws's summons, the haze lay thick in the valleys and reduced visibility to less than 100 yards, but he took pains to examine all the artillery positions he passed. Finding one battery badly placed, he asked its captain who put him there. Colonel Chilton, the officer, answered. The back of the general's neck grew red, a sure sign that he was angry, and he jerked his head higher, another familiar omen of an inward battle. Colonel Chilton takes a lot upon himself, he said, and touched his horse. To the sharp accompaniment of musketry from the river bank, he climbed an eminence about a mile and a half southwest of the lower end of the town, an eminence known from that day as Lee's Hill. There he learned that the Federals were attempting to throw pontoon bridges across the Rappahannock at three points, the first at the foot of Hawk Street in the town, the second just below the railroad bridge, and the third near the mouth of Deep Run. The location of these bridges is shown with the numerals 1, 2, and 3 on the map on page 445. The first and second bridges were within effective range of the artillery on the long ridge west of the town, but they could not be bombarded without danger to the houses and population of Fredericksburg. To delay the construction of these two crossings, therefore, Lee had to rely on infantry. The third bridge was within range of the better guns on that part of the line, but the ground in front of it on the right bank of the river was open and so dominated by the Federal artillery on the left bank that the Confederate infantry would be too exposed to offer effective resistance. Nevertheless, as Jackson's Corps had not been brought up, the crossing had to be delayed as long as practicable at all three points. The following map shows the ranges from the ridge, which fell away in elevation and had a wider plain in its front south of the city. Opposite the first and second bridges General McClaws had posted Barksdale's Mississippi Brigade. The third bridge, near Deep Run, was in front of General Hood's lines. From the outset it was apparent that Hood could not prevent the laying of the bridge. The action and the outcome were largely in the hands of Barksdale's men, who were already engaged hotly when Lee rode to the front. As the haze hung long over the town and was thickened by the smoke from Barksdale's rifles, little could be seen from Lee's Hill. 
the commanding general had to rely on reports that came regularly and told confidently of continued success in beating off the engineers. The determined Federals would rush to their farthest boat and would attempt to throw another into position only to meet a sharp and accurate fire from the Mississippians. Down would drop the tools, back would run the Federals, and the same drama would be repeated in all its parts. By nine o'clock the line of boats was almost complete to the southern side of the river opposite Deep Run, but the work on the upstream bridges had progressed scarcely at all since dawn. A little later the fog began to lift, and the impatient Federals on the Stafford Heights could make out the houses from which the Mississippi volunteers were sharpshooting. At 10 a.m., the whole opposite shoreline blazed with fire, and a mighty roar echoed against the face of Lee's Hill. A hundred guns were soon in action, pouring their fire indiscriminately into the buildings occupied by the soldiers and into those where only trembling children and anxious mothers were. The cruelty of it aroused Lee's wrath. These people, he said with emotion, delight to destroy the weak and those who can make no defense, it just suits them. From Lee's Hill there soon was disclosed a spectacle the magnificence of which made men catch their breath. Only the spires of the churches, rising in protest against such godless war, were visible above the mists that seemed, from the Confederate side, still to cling protectingly over the little town. Breaking over this blanket of haze and rising from it were the white spheres of exploding shell. Across the river the high ground was billowed in smoke, along which ran endless tons of flame from battery to battery. Behind the active batteries could be glimpsed long waiting lines of blue infantry, parked wagon trains, and a multitude of guns with champing horses, ready at the bugle note to hurl new pieces into action or to bring limbers and caissons bouncing down the hillsides to the pontoons. The roar was continuous, and like the bed of some vast volcano, the hay seemed to bubble with the smoke of explosion. Ere long, darker clouds of smoke began to rise from houses set afire by the shell. In the still air these clouds mounted up and up, as if from rival altars kindled to the god of war. At a high elevation, a breeze caught them and spread them in a long streamer over the landscape. Riding untroubled over all were two great balloons, the eyes of the Federal Army. Fifty rounds per gun, five thousand shell, the Union batteries fired, while frightened women prayed in cellars and the riflemen of Barksdale's brigade found such shelter as they could behind shaking walls in smoke-stifled streets. Then the fire slackened until only the slow gunners were left, shamefaced, to count their final rounds. Soon the artillery ceased altogether, for the Confederates had not wasted their all-too-scant ammunition in practice beyond their range. But the silence lasted only a few minutes. Out from their cover rushed the bridge builders once more. Selected batteries covered their renewed attempt to complete the crossings, and from the houses along the waterfront echoed again the defiant fire of the Mississippians. Under good leadership, they had suffered little during the bombardment, and now, at the first and second pontoon bridges, they were ready as ever to dispute with their rifles the passage of the river. Already they had gained half a day and seemed as fresh in their fire as they had been at dawn. Lee had listened to it all and had watched as much as was visible from his station. Busy artillerists had brought to the hilltop two new 30-pounder parrot guns from Richmond and numbers of lighter pieces. Longstreet, Stewart, and others of rank had come, observed, rejoiced, and departed as their several duties demanded. Reports from the town continued at short intervals. And each time that Barksdale proudly announced that a new attempt had been beaten off, Lee's countenance lighted up. A double pontoon bridge near Deep Run was completed by eleven o'clock, though the infantry did not attempt to pass over. Still Barksdale's men hung on. Six, seven, eight, even nine times they drove back the detachment of engineer troops. Before noon, Barksdale was notified by Longstreet that the disposition of the defending force was complete and that he could retire when he thought proper, but he continued to dispute the crossing. About one o'clock Federal infantry streamed down the heights and leaped into waiting bateau, which immediately put out, with strong arms at the sweeps. If they could not build the bridge, with Barksdale's men to oppose them, the Federals evidently were determined to cross the river, drive off the Mississippians, and establish a bridgehead. As the purpose of the enemy became plain, the riflemen quickened their fire. In every bateau bluecoats began to drop, but the stream was narrow, the oarsmen numerous, and soon the first contingent sprang ashore and deployed. Others followed quickly. The game was up.
Weary now from their long fight and too widely scattered to offer instant resistance, the Confederates slipped away from their posts, withdrew to streets farther from the shore, and rallied there. Nothing material was to be gained by prolonging the action in the town, but the fighting blood of the men was aroused and they contested the enemy's advance stubbornly and skillfully. It was seven o'clock that evening before the last of them crossed the open ground between the town and the ridge and left Fredericksburg to its captors. By that time both the upper bridges had been completed. Meanwhile, of course, Jackson had been notified to prepare to bring up his troops if it should develop that the enemy was not attempting to cross the river farther downstream. After nightfall Barksdale's brigade was relieved by T.R.R. Cobb's Georgians, the force on Mary's Heights was strengthened, and a P. Hill was ordered up from Yerby's and Taliaferro from Guinea's to move to the right of the line so that Hood could draw in his extended flank. At the hour when these orders were dispatched to A. P. Hill, Jackson's corps was widely scattered, as the sketch shows. There was much, in fact, to suggest the situation at Sharpsburg when Lee had faced McClellan with Jackson's entire command, McClaws, R. H. Anderson, and Walker detached, yet Lee did not hurry early from Buckner's Neck or D. H. Hill from Port Royal. The reason was simple. He could hardly believe he was to have the good fortune of receiving Burnside's attack at Fredericksburg. It did not seem credible that the whole Federal Army was to be hurled against the heights where Longstreet was waiting, with his ranges set and his infantry at ease. Commanding so vast an army, Burnside had ample men to make a strong feint at Fredericksburg while undertaking a major turning operation down the river, say, in the vicinity of Skinker's Neck, where some signs of Federal activity had been observed. If Burnside assaulted at Fredericksburg with only a part of his army, the arrival of Taliaferro and A.P. Hill would give Lee enough men to defeat him. In case the new Union commander planned simultaneously to cross farther downstream, there must be a sufficient force in his front to delay him there until the rest of the army could be drawn back to the line of the North Anna. Pending the disclosure of the federal plan, it was the course of wisdom to leave Early and D.H. Hill where they were. Concentration, one of the rules of war, could be neglected for a day in dealing with an adversary who seemed about to defy all the rules. Hayes again covered the river valley on the morning of the 12th and screened the movements of the enemy from the expectant army. The Federals ineffectively shelled the Confederate positions during the morning with their long-range guns across the Rappahannock, but little of the southern artillery could reach the farther shore, and as Lee had no thought of changing his decision to refrain from firing on the town, it was a one-sided bombardment. The Confederate batteries answered only when the enemy showed himself on exposed ground. About noon, when the fog had lifted below Fredericksburg, Lee rode to the right, where he was joined by Jackson and, a little later, by Major von Bork of Stewart's staff. Von Bork bore a message from Stuart, reporting the rapid concentration of the Federals in front of the Confederate right, and he said he had been within a few hundred yards of the enemy's advanced units. At Lee's instance, he led him and Jackson to the vantage point. First they rode to a barn, where they dismounted. Then the three crept forward along a ditch that carried them to an eminence on which stood two old gateposts. They were now within 400 yards of the enemy, so close that when they used their glasses, they could distinguish the features of the men opposite them. As they carefully examined the enemy's line, everything indicated a general advance. Across one of the two pontoon bridges columns of bluecoats were marching, regiment on regiment, while over the other bridge, sheeted wagons and flawlessly equipped batteries were moving. Immediately in front, Federal picks were flying and stout arms were shoveling dirt for a line of rifle pits that swept along the riverside as far as I could reach. At one point, 32 field guns were already in battery. Slowly and curiously Lee and Jackson scrutinized men and weapons, while Von Bork bent his giant's shoulders in the ditch and asked himself what would happen to the southern cause if sharpshooters should pick off the two observers or if a sudden rush of cavalry should take them prisoner. Finally, Lee put up his glasses and crept back as he had gone, Jackson following him. Lee had seen enough to convince him that this was a major advance and not a feint. The Federals evidently intended to make their main effort there and not farther down the river. Moreover, the activity of the enemy indicated that an attack would probably come the next day. D. H. Hill and Early, therefore, must be recalled at once from Port Royal and Buckner's Neck and the army must be made ready for the morrow. Jackson left to draft orders for D. H. Hill and Early. Talia Farrow and A. P. Hill were already coming up.
As Lee rode back to the center of the line, he was more than satisfied at the outlook, even though all the signs indicated that the Federals were massing to attack at his weakest point, his right flank. It was better to have them there than farther down the Rappahannock. I shall try to do them all the damage in our power when they move forward, he said simply. Night brought a cold and biting wind, and on the picket line, where no fires were allowed, the men suffered cruelly. As the bitter night wore on the wind died like a sullen fury, and in its place the freezing fog rose from the ground where the unthawed snow remained in spots the feeble December sun of the previous week had not reached. One soldier died of exposure, and when the late dawn came at last, men rejoiced at the prospect of a battle whose horrors could not be worse than those of the night. The fog at daybreak was so thick that nothing was visible beyond fifty or sixty yards, but by the time Lee reached his observation post the camps were astir. Crouching over their fires, the men ate their rough rations, wiped the moisture from their rifles, and looked at one another with the forced gaiety that soldiers always show when in their hearts they ask themselves which of them will gather again at the next mess and which will be lying in convulsed death on the battlefield. Quickly they were in position along the heights, shivering and excited. The invisible enemy was astir, too, for up the hillside drifted the echo of phantom voices, the roll of drums, snatches of bugle calls and, ere long, the music of bands and well-remembered tunes. General officers began ere long to ride up with reports and reassurance. Early had arrived on the right. D. H. Hill's long march from Port Royal had put him in position. The entire army was concentrated to the last regiment. Longstreet's front spread from the high ridge opposite Becks Island to a point beyond Deep Run, Jackson's Corps extended thence to the vicinity of Hamilton's Crossing. On Longstreet's left, R. H. Anderson defended the high ground almost to Mary's Heights, where Ransom was in reserve. McClaws covered the foot of Mary's Heights in a sunken road that was from that dread day to be forever renowned. From the southern end of the sunken road McClaws's line wound past Howison's Mill, across Hazel Run and over Lee's Hill to a point beyond the home of the historian Howison. Their picket took up the line and followed the curve of the ridge nearly at right angles until he reached the vicinity of Dr. Reynolds's house. From that point Hood's line stood on the ridge. His right joined the left of A. P. Hill, who held the front almost to Hamilton's crossing. Between Hill and the river was the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac Railroad. In his rear were Early and Talia Farrow in a second line. D. H. Hill was behind them. Stuart was at hand and was hovering beyond the right flank. Every rifle that the Army of Northern Virginia could muster was at Lee's instant command. 306 guns were in position. 78,000 men were ready for the worst that Burnside's 125,000 could do. Here was Lee's line. Presently came Jackson, apparelled in unwanted splendor, a new uniform coat, a hat adorned with shining braid, mounted on a well-caparisoned and magnificent horse. Even though they knew that the swelling fire of the skirmishers would soon break into battle, the comrades of the grim Stonewall could not repress questioning as to the source of so much splendor, and when Jackson confessed in his low voice that he believed it was some of his friend Stuart's doing, badinage overwhelmed him. Stuart was as proud and as pleased as if he had coaxed one of Jackson's blue-stocking clerical aides to join in the most riotous rondelle of his banjo player Sweeney. Jackson was for business, despite his dress parade attire. There must be no defensive, said he, but instant attack under cover of the fog, which would keep the Federals from employing their artillery across the river. Stuart seconded him. But Lee said no. He would meet the Federals where he stood, wear them down, let them break their fine divisions in hopeless assaults on his position, while he held back and conserved his strength. Then, when their losses had reduced their numbers nearer to parity, then he would strike, but not sooner. Longstreet's spirit, as always, was aroused at the prospect of battle, and his graceless humor found its usual but in the grave Jackson. General, he said, do not all these multitudes of Federals frighten you? We shall see very soon whether I shall not frighten them," Jackson retorted, calmly. Jackson now started to rejoin his command, but Longstreet pursued his jest, Jackson, what are you going to do with all those people over there? Sir, answered Jackson, as he mounted, we will give them the bayonet. Longstreet had reported early that the orders of command which he had heard through the fog confirmed the general belief that the attack would be on the right. Jackson was of the same mind.
As soon, therefore, as he could dispose of details that awaited his decision, Lee rode in that direction. Attended by Jackson and Stewart, he covered the whole of the long flank. Everywhere he was received with cheers, but there was great hilarity and some misgiving over the appearance of the much bedizened Stonewall. Said the soldiers as he went along, Old Jack will be afraid of his clothes and will not get down to work. Leaving Jackson in his glory and confusion, Lee crossed with Stuart to a field on the flank of the Federals, and there he tried to ascertain if the enemy was moving. He could hear the vague hum of many voices, but he could see nothing distinctly. The fog, however, was beginning to fade, for soon sharpshooters' bullets began to hum about the little group and a few shadowy forms could be glimpsed, as if the Federal outpost had seen the party and was deploying to capture it. Lee took his time, regardless of the Federal riflemen, and did not retire until it was apparent that further reconnaissance in the fog would yield no result. Back to his post of observation, he galloped in a whirlwind of cheers. Had his mind been less occupied with the task before him, he might have recalled his old study of Napoleon and might well have compared his position with that of Archduke Charles in May, 1809, when the Emperor had crossed the Danube and had challenged the Austrians. Osborne had been Napoleon's Hamilton's crossing and Essling his Fredericksburg. Two days' hard fighting had made the Battle of Osborne Essling the first defeat for the invading Corsican, Adsit Omen. Imperceptibly the baffling fog began to dissipate after Lee resumed his lookout. By ten o'clock it was manifest that the Confederate positions on the ridge could now be made up by the unseen enemy in the valley, for the impatient captains of a few enterprising Union batteries opened a desultory fire on the right. Then the white steeples of Fredericksburg's churches were visible above the gray mist. The blurred outlines of the Stafford Heights could be vaguely seen. Vision widened. Drab daylight began to soften into gold under the rays of a mounting sun. A few minutes later the ready war god rang up the curtain on the scene set for slaughter, and against the vast backdrop of the gun-studded hills of Stafford, the whole stage was disclosed from the upper fringe of Fredericksburg streets to the distant grey meadows in front of Hamilton's crossing. Then as now, distances must have been deceptive. It must have seemed incredible that a mile and more, a distance too great to be covered by the short-ranged guns in the southern batteries, separated the observing audience on the crest of the ridge from the massed multitudes of actors on the far-sweeping plain below. Fifty-five thousand Jackson reckoned in his front, with guns past counting. Hidden in the streets of Fredericksburg must be other thousands. Never had the might of the potent North been so fully deployed before the eyes of the ragged soldiery of the South. Test the ranges on the left, Lee ordered at 10.30, and soon a quick blaze of fire swept from Mary's Heights northward. The enemy seemed to take it for a challenge. Almost at once, Lee saw long, heavy blue lines begin in advance against the lower part of the ridge on the right, where waited the veterans of A.P. Hill, who had saved the day at Sharpsburg. Scarcely had the Federals started forward than white smoke puffs could be seen on the enemy's left. They were from two of Pelham's horse artillery, only two, set boldly out in the field. Soon it was apparent that their fire was enfilading the approaching column. The lines halted. The men sought such cover as the undulation of the open ground offered. Busy batteries could be seen hurrying to silence Pelham. Four of them opened quickly on him. It seemed certain that he would be destroyed. One gun was disabled, but through the gathering smoke, a few minutes later, he shifted his other rifle and put the enemy off his range. Again and again he moved, one piece against sixteen, but he was not silenced. The Federal attacking column remained where it was. The whole army waited, as if to watch the single combat of the Paladin gunner. Lee's judgment told him that Stuart had opened too soon, but his admiration for Pelham's fine fighting rose with each round. It is glorious to see such courage in one so young, he exclaimed. Stuart had thrice to recall Pelham before the young artillerist abandoned the unequal fight. When at last he withdrew, the Federal artillery began to plaster the front of a P. Hill's division spitefully. Not a gun answered them. Old Jack was unwilling to show his hand for the small stakes his hidden batteries might claim. Soon Lee saw the Federals marching undisturbed down the Richmond Stage Road to extend their left flank. Presently they halted and faced about.
It was a splendid deployment, worthy of Lee's brother engineer, George Gordon Meade, who had stood with him on the deck of the tiny Pat Rita 15 years before, when Scott had made his hazardous reconnaissance of the seafront at Vera Cruz. No sooner were the Federals in position than they surged forward in a long line for their first attack. Steadily they came on, their well-dressed lines plainly visible from Lee's lookout. Still the ridge in their front sent no challenge. For all the opposition they encountered, they might have been recruits in some training maneuver, far from the field of action. They had narrowed their distance to 1,000 yards, to 900, and were only 800 yards away when, in a single crash, Hill's artillery swept their lines. The startled troops halted, wavered at the second salvo, and then, in confusion, fell back as they had come. A first repulse, the enemy must try again. Longstreet on the left had opened his batteries at 11 o'clock to create a diversion in the belief that the attack on the Confederate right was a major assault. His fire swept across Fredericksburg and played on the bridges. The 30-pounder Parrot and the smaller guns on Lee's Hill added their metal. The explosion shook the ridge and filled the air around the commander's lookout with the intoxicating smoke of battle. The artillery had a commanding field of fire. Lee's Hill reaches an elevation of 210 feet. Mary's heights rise to 130. Between them flows Hazel Run. On a line from north to south, Lee's Hill is about four-tenths of a mile farther westward from Mary's Heights, which stood out like a promontory. So wide and so open was the zone of fire in front of Lee's Hill that no troops could hope to endure shelling long enough to reach the sides of the hill from the plain below. Mary's Heights were closer to the enemy and seemed to be easier. The town gave cover for massing the assaulting columns. In front of the heights, diagonally from left to right, ran a deep ditch that offered good shelter at a distance varying from 330 to 900 yards. Between this ditch and the heights the ground rose gradually, with one dip about midway that was not under direct fire. But from this dip the incline was steady and open, though not very steep, to the telegraph road. This road turns sharply from the west at the southeast corner of Mary's Heights and runs thence northward. It had been cut from the lower part of the ridge to a width of about 25 feet and had stone retaining walls on either side. The road itself was sunken, scarcely visible from the town side. The outer retaining wall was four feet high and constituted a perfect parapet for infantry. Above the sunken road were the guns. The general position is shown on the map printed on page 453. The sketch of the front of attack, on the opposite page, shows it in more detail with contour intervals of 10 feet. Behind the stone wall in the sunken road stood a North Carolina regiment of Cook's Brigade and a Georgia Brigade, commanded by General T. R. R. Cobb, a publicist of distinction who had been very critical of Lee during the early part of the campaign of 1862 but had been completely won by Lee's kindness. The batteries behind them were the well-equipped Washington Artillery, with Ransom's division of two North Carolina brigades in support. The heights and the sunken road, in a word, constituted a death trap, were the Federals foolish enough to venture into it? The Confederates speculated and doubted until, at 11.30 o'clock, the incredible answer came. Out from the streets poured the Federal infantry, headed straight for Mary's Heights, precisely as Lee had hoped, yet scarcely had dared hope. General Burnside most obligingly was preparing to waste in costly assault the great odds his country had given him. Not only so, but he was deploying in the most injudicious manner, right in front, instead of double columns in the center. The Unionists did not even choose the weakest part of Mary's Heights for their assault. Instead of attacking farther to the northward, where the Confederate artillery was less numerous and less advantageously placed, they made their advance against the steepest part of the heights and directly against the sunken road. It was magnificent, but it was not war. On they came, plainly visible to Lee, completing their deployment as they advanced. They planted three standards defiantly, but in the very act received the full blast of the artillery almost in their faces. So intense was the fire and so perfectly laid that the ranks thinned at the very first round and soon were melting back to the ditch in blue and blood. The Confederate infantry had scarcely anything to do in repulsing this first advance. Shellfire sufficed. First blood for Longstreet as for Jackson, but every indication that heavier assaults against both positions were to be delivered speedily.
On the right, as one o'clock approached, Lee could see the stout columns slowly massing. Almost on the hour, the Stafford Heights broke into flames, as if the door of a furnace had been thrown wide, and with a shout the Federal left wing swept forward against Jackson. It was a major assault this time, and manifestly it was to be delivered in a gigantic effort to take the ridges and turn the right of Lee's line. Quickly the Confederate batteries opened in reply. Gaps were cut in the charging columns. Windrows of dead were left behind. In a long volley the Confederate infantry opened, claiming grievous toll in every regiment. A minute more and the fire was so heavy as almost to drown the nearer batteries on Mary's Heights, against which the Federals were beginning to form for another assault. The advance was slower now on the right but it seemed resistless. Gradually it concentrated on a neck of woodland that extended from the Confederate front across the railroad. Soon the roar centered there. More and more of the enemy were drawn into the woods, as into a vortex. Presently the fire was closer to the ridge, and whenever the sound of the enemy's cheers could be heard in the din, they were pitched to a note of triumph. Something had gone amiss. The Federals had found an opening. They might be breaking the line. From Lee's Hill it was impossible to tell. Ere long, keen eyes with good field glasses could distinguish figures making their way to the rear in garb of a different color from the blue dots on the plain. Prisoners. Some disaster had overtaken Hill. The enemy was farther into the woods now, was Jackson being whipped? Advanced batteries had been withdrawn. The guns on Prospect Hill, which had broken up the first Federal advance, could not bear on the woods where the Federals entered. There was fury and confusion, and, on Lee's Hill, wonder and misgiving. More prisoners, wounded streaming back, but no withdrawal. If the Union troops were not advancing they were at least holding their ground. In front of Mary's Heights they had formed again by this time, were advancing and were being hurled back over their own dead and wounded, but there on the right, what was happening? South of the neck of woods, they were beaten back, and from the line of the railroad were firing uselessly in their front, still they struggled through the woods and on toward the ridge. On the left of the thicket, also, an advance to the railroad was underway. The Federals with their overmastering artillery were plastering the whole front. A shell buried itself close to Lee under the parapet but did not explode. Through the smoke, Lee found himself looking across the valley of the Rappahannock to see if he could locate in the yard at Chatham the old tree under which he had wooed Mary Custis. As his thought and vision ranged, officers came and went, reports were received and orders sent to the strange music of the thirty-pounder parrot in the redoubt. Round after round it roared on in excellent practice until after the gunners had rammed home their thirty-ninth charge. Then there was a discordant explosion, a rending sound, and the breech of the gun split into a dozen fragments that fell to the ground. Lee was nearby, as were Longstreet and Pendleton, but none of these and not one of the artillerists was touched. Suspense was now at the highest. Reports from the right told only that the enemy had made his way between the brigades of Lane and Archer and was fighting savagely. Another column had crept up the ravine of Deep Run and had engaged the left of Pender's brigade. At last, above the deep roar of the artillery, there came the echo of the high, quavering rebel yell, an unearthly, fiendish yell, such as no other troops or civilized beings ever uttered, as a federal chaplain reported. It must be a Confederate countercharge. A few minutes later, as anxious eyes and ears were strained, the Federals began to run out of the wood they had entered. The very trees seemed to discharge them, limping, crawling, retreating in the confusion or stubbornly and slowly falling back, firing as they went. Louder swelled the rebel yell, faster rolled the fire, until, with a gasp of excited joy, the observers on Lee's Hill saw the familiar ragged men in butternut burst from the wood and down deep run in all the passion of pursuit. On they went, close after the Federals, valiantly forming line, only to lose it again as the fleet of foot sought to overtake the laggard Federals. Lee's eyes flashed as he saw them, and the blood of Light Horse Harry fought in his veins with the calmer strain of the peace-loving Carters. Turning to Longstreet, he revealed the whole man in a single brief sentence, It is well that war is so terrible, we should grow too fond of it. As he uttered the words, he seemed in the eyes of a British correspondent who stood by to have about him an antique heroism. Out into the plain the Confederates pursued, heedless of their officers' commands.
soon they were under fire and began to drop fast. At length those who had come from the neck of woods turned back in good order, but those who had repulsed the attack at deep run rushed on until their officers in desperation had almost to beat down their muskets. Finally, after they had sustained needless losses, they too retired. But not in content of mind. They were Carolinians, and they felt humiliated that they had been denied the honor of charging their foe to the very banks of the river. Some were weeping in their vexation, and some were swearing at General Hood as they stumbled back over federal corpses to their own line. It's because he had no confidence in Carolinians, they protested. If we had been some of his Texans, he would have let us go on. Whatever had happened on the right, and Lee did not know, it had been rectified, the front had been restored and the enemy had been driven back. It was not yet three o'clock, and the enemy might renew his assaults in that quarter, but there was scarcely time for speculation on this, because the enemy was again madly hurling his brigades against Mary's Heights in a third attack. General Cobb had been mortally wounded by an enfilading fire from some buildings on the left, and as the cartridges of his gallant brigade ran low, Kershaw's men and two more regiments of Cook's North Carolinians had been sent down to the sunken road. Kershaw had assumed command there just as this third attack was taking form and he had his troops in line four to six deep, practically filling the road, but they were so composed in the confidence of victory that each line fired in turn, or else those in front passed their empty rifles to the men behind them and tipped their loaded pieces. Not one was injured by the fire of those in the rear ranks. The third attack was repulsed, but it had been pushed so far and with so much vigor that Lee began to wonder if the troops were numerous enough to hold the ground. General, said he to Longstreet, they are massing very heavily and will break your line, I am afraid. Longstreet answered proudly, General, if you put every man now on the other side of the Potomac in that field to approach me over the same line and give me plenty of ammunition, I will kill them all before they reach my line. Look to your right, you are in some danger there, but not on my line. It was not an empty boast on the part of old Pete. Again, and with fresh troops, the Federals came forward, and again they were hurled back before a single man could reach the stone wall. Attack followed attack until the soldiers in the sunken road lost count of their number. Their ammunition was exhausted as they poured volleys into the advancing enemy at intervals of only a few seconds, so they took the cartridge boxes from the dead and from the wounded. They had no medical relief closer than the field hospital behind the hill, and the only house into which even the nearest could be removed was that of Mrs. Stevens, facing the road. Mrs. Stevens herself was there, having refused to abandon the place, and in a ceaseless hail of bullets she bound the wounds of such soldiers as could reach her shelter. Her very petticoats she tore up for bandages, while the Federals seemed to make her house a target. When Lee heard of what had happened there, his wrath rose, as it always did when non-combatants suffered. I wish those people would let Mrs. Stevens alone, he exclaimed hotly. About 3.30 there came a lull in front of Mary's Heights, while new brigades were prepared for the slaughter. On the right, as on the left, though the artillery continued to roar, there were no infantry charges. The enemy had enough of Jackson's fire. His battle was over, with his lines completely restored. Taking advantage of the pause in the infantry assaults, Colonel Walton on Mary's Heights asked that his Washington artillery, the caissons of which were almost empty, be relieved by other batteries. Word was quickly sent to Alexander to bring up fresh guns. His shortest road to the heights was across the front and up a ravine. Without hesitating he hurried his pieces forward in the very face of the enemy. Down the telegraph road, wrote one of the men who stood behind the stone wall, the battery came, their horses rearing and plunging, drivers burying the points of their spurs deep into the flanks of the foaming steeds, riders in front bending low upon the saddle bows to escape the shells that now filled the air, or plowed up the earth beneath the horse's hoofs. One gun was overturned and the column was delayed, but the piece was quickly righted and the wild rush began again, the men on the caissons clinging with a death-like grip to retain their seats, the heavy wheels spinning around like mad and bounding high in the air. Officers shouted and urged the men on, the batteries turned up the grade, exposed to the full fury of the fire, reached the crest, swung to the right, and unlimbered. Then, and not till then, did Walton's exhausted men drag their scorching, smoke-covered guns to the rear. The Federals saw the withdrawal and, noting the cessation of fire, assumed that a retreat was beginning. With a shout, they sprang forward again. 
but Alexander's guns opened instantly, the infantry in the sunken road were well warmed to their bloody work, and the combined fire repulsed the enemy once more, his casualties added to the writhing army on which the attacking columns trampled as they passed forward and as they retreated. The day was nearly done, but the bewildered Burnside stubbornly pushed in fresh troops in a mad determination to achieve the impossible by the weight of his numbers and the immensity of his sacrifices. To meet him, Lee ordered Jenkins's brigade from the right to support McClaws and directed Kemper to reinforce Ransom. Two regiments of Kemper's brigade were sent down into the sunken road to relieve the 24th North Carolina, which had been there two days. On the enemy came, with strong supports. If one brigade faltered and lay down, another pressed over it, when one fell back, a second dashed forward. The whole field seemed alive with a blue that by this time was beginning to blend into the twilight on the chill ground. Each time the folly of the blind assault seemed more criminal. One man, presumably an officer, made his way and scathed to within thirty yards of the sunken road and there fell dead. Behind him a few scattered bodies lay at intervals, but few got closer than one hundred yards. Beyond that distance, the bleeding forms were piled man on man in ghastly barricades. Still the gallant columns pressed on toward the stone wall. It was nearly seven o'clock when the final assault withered in the face of artillery that now was firing by the flashes of the Federal small arms. On the center, between Lee's Hill and the left of A. P. Hill's line, there had been no infantry assaults. Late in the afternoon, on the right, Jackson thought he observed preparations for a renewal of the attack, and when this did not materialize he deployed for the offensive, only to find that his advance came under such a heavy fire of artillery that nothing but slaughter could be expected. Out of this brief and abortive deployment developed the myth that Jackson planned a night attack, which Lee vetoed. Before the final attack on Mary's Heights had been repulsed, any general counterattack would have been dangerous, after that time it was impossible, even if Jackson's experience had not proved that the commanding Federal artillery would have swept the southern lines precisely as the Confederate batteries had mowed down the Federals in their front. As far as is known, Lee did not consider such a thrust. No one who studies the ground can justly criticize him for failing to do so. When the artillery at last died away in black night, the very skies seemed to reflect the blood that had been spilled to no purpose in front of the sunken road. First there was a dim, ghostly light beyond the horizon that grew in brightness until it covered a wide arc of the horizon, then it broke into the mysterious shafts of such an aurora borealis as the soldiers from the far south had never seen. It was, in their eyes, a warning of what the morrow would bring forth, for nearly everyone expected Burnside to renew the attack. Despite his losses, the Federal commander assuredly would try his strength again in a more intelligent maneuver against the Confederate position. At headquarters, Witherly rode under the glow of the aurora, his generals were all but unanimous in expressing this view. Only Hood insisted that Burnside would not resume the battle. Lee himself was of opinion that Burnside would make his major attack the next morning. In the highest spirits, he predicted that further federal assaults would be repelled and that the Army of Northern Virginia would then resume the offensive. He voiced the expectation of a renewal of the battle in the first telegraphic report of the day's action, sent the Secretary of War at 9 p.m. He believed that his opponent would not throw away his troops again in attacks against Mary's Heights, but would maneuver for a turning movement. Nothing more was to be gained by luring the enemy to unfortified hills. Consequently, he ordered the entire line strengthened so that he could hold it with part of his force and have the rest of the army free to maneuver. Before midnight, his judgment seemed to be confirmed by the capture of a messenger bearing a memorandum of Burnside's plan for the next day's fight, the last fight of the Army of the Potomac, as many of the Confederates confidently believed. There was much to hear and much to do as the night wore on. In particular, Jackson was reminded tactfully to replenish his ammunition, and new reports of a threatened movement against James River were carefully sifted. Lee learned, also, in some detail, of what had happened on the right at 1 p.m. when he had seen the enemy mysteriously enter the neck of woods that extended across the railroad, opposite A. P. Hill's front. It developed that this was a bit of marshy ground, which Hill had thought impassable and had not protected, though Von Bork had suggested that the timber be felled and General Lane had specifically pointed out the danger the position presented. Archer's brigade had been on the right of this gap and Lane on the left, with Gregg in the second line, behind the gap. Finding the weak spot, the Federals had poured in. 
Two regiments on Archer's left and the whole of Lane's brigade had given ground, but Archer had changed front on his right and had stubbornly resisted. When the Federals had penetrated the woods, they had surprised one regiment of Gregg's brigade, and Gregg himself had mistaken the enemy for a retiring Confederate force. In the melee, Gregg had fallen and some of his men had been roughly handled, but Lawton's brigade under Colonel E. N. Atkinson, Trimble's under Colonel R. F. Hoke, and Early's under Colonel J. I. Walker had come up quickly from the second line and had pushed the enemy back. As Hoke's men had rushed forward in pursuit, Gregg had pulled himself up by a sapling and, though dying and unable to speak, had cheered the men onward by waving his hat. The troops who had charged the enemy on the railroad and had then pursued them into the plain had been Atkinson's and Hoke's. Thomas's men and two regiments of Lane's had restored the front that Lane had held. The only other point where the enemy had reached the railroad had been on the left of Pender, a long deep run, and there he had been driven back by a countercharge of a part of Law's brigade. This action at Deep Run and on Hill's front had cost Lee 3054 casualties, and, though it had ended without disaster, it had not been altogether satisfactory. Longstreet had felt that Hood should have attacked more heavily while the fighting was underway near his position. A brief and troubled night broke in heavy fog on the morning of December 14. Riding early to the front, Lee was pleased to find that the fatigue parties had done their work well in fortifying the heights. My army, he said, is as much stronger for these new entrenchments as if I had received reinforcements of 20,000 men. He kept the diggers at their work, and hour by hour he saw the parapets rise higher. Confident of his ability to throw Burnside back a second day, Lee had only one concern, his ammunition was low, and his chief ordnance officer reported that a railway train then on its way contained all the reserve supply from Richmond. Lee could only hope for thrifty gunnery that day, while he urged the War Department to speed the manufacture of more shell. As the weather was clear, the sun quickly scattered the fog and gave to the expected new battle the setting of a perfect winter's day. When the field became visible, the enemy was seen holding the ditch in front of Mary's Heights, but the men were flat on the ground and showed no disposition to stir. The ends of the streets facing the Confederate positions were barricaded, and the walls of many of the houses were loopholed for infantry. Manifestly, Burnside did not intend to resume the attack on Mary's Heights, and as no reports came of any activity farther to the left, Lee concluded that the offensive would not be renewed on that wing. Sending fresh long-range artillery to Jackson, Lee rode to the right and, with Stonewall and Hood, went to Prospect Hill, the eminence from which Lindsay Gordon's artillery had broken up the first demonstration on the morning of the 13th, we had a magnificent view of the Federal lines on their left, some seven in number, and each, seemingly, a mile in length, Hood wrote. General Jackson here turned to me and asked my estimate of the strength of the enemy then in sight and in our immediate front. I answered 50,000, and he remarked that he had estimated their numbers at 55,000. Strange to say, amid that immense assemblage of federal troops, not a standard was to be seen, the colors were all lowered. What did all this mean? Was it a trick, or could it be possible that the enemy had abandoned the offensive? With the question puzzling him, Lee returned to his own post of observation and examined the ground again. The Union troops were burying the dead within their lines and were carrying off such of the wounded as they could reach. Now and again the skirmishers engaged in angry exchanges and the Federal batteries fired a few half-hearted rounds. That was all. Noon and afternoon brought no change. The waiting Confederates were surprised, then disappointed, then depressed. Lee's amazement grew. General, he said to Longstreet, I am losing faith in your friend General Burnside, and he put down the captured memorandum outlining operations for the 14th as a ruse de guerre. Evening came, and not a man had been engaged at close range. Still, it did not seem credible that so great an army was ready to abandon so elaborate a maneuver after only one day's partial engagement of his forces. When Lee sat down at night to write his preliminary report of the battle, he could only describe the situation. He did not attempt to forecast its development. On the morning of the 15th, with his own line still further strengthened, Lee observed that the enemy had dug rifle pits and had thrown up fortifications on the outskirts of the town, as if to repel attacks. He saw a ghastly sight besides, the Federal dead that still remained between the lines had changed color. They no longer were blue, but naked and discolored. 
During the night, they had been stripped by shivering Confederates, many of whom now boasted overcoats, boots, and jackets for which the people of the North had paid. It was ghoulish business, reprobated by the enemy but excused by the beneficiaries, who asked whether it was better for them to freeze or to take clothing the former owners would not miss. Jackson came during the morning for a conference, but so far as is known, there was no discussion of a counterstroke. How could there be one, when the federal lines were now well fortified, and the superior artillery was still in position on the plain and across the river to blast the Confederate lines? Lee's spirits sank. If the Federals did not intend to renew the attack, the victory would be barren, save for the losses inflicted. It was a heavy price to pay for having to defend the line of the Rappahannock in order to procure supplies from the lower valley of the river. The strategy of the commissary might be unescapable, but it was disheartening. During the afternoon of the 15th, Burnside sent out a flag of truce for the burial of the dead and for the relief of such of the wounded as had survived 48 hours on the ground without even the poor comfort of a canteen of water. Lee readily consented to a truce on that part of the front where the Federals had fallen. Soon the surgeons, the ambulance detachments, and the burial details mingled with the Confederates in the field. The horror of this scene was far greater at close range than it had appeared from the lines. In the space of an acre or so were 1,100 dead Federals, some of them piled seven or eight deep, swollen, as one horrified witness had observed, to twice their natural size, black as Negroes in most cases, lying in every conceivable posture, some on their backs with gaping jaws, some with eyes as large as walnuts, protruding with glassy stare, some doubled up like a contortionist, here one without a head, there one without legs, yonder a head and legs without a trunk, everywhere horrible expressions. Fear, rage, agony, madness, torture, lying pools of blood, lying with heads half buried in mud, with fragments of shells sticking and oozing brain, with bullet holes all over the puffed limbs. A fifth of them had been killed by artillery, the mini balls from the heights and from the sunken road had accounted for the rest. There could be no reasonable computation of the gross casualties. Not until months afterward was it known that the Federals had lost 12,653, compared to 5309 on the Confederate side, many of the latter having trifling wounds. In front of Mary's Heights, where 9,000 Federals had fallen, McClaws had lost only 858, in Cobb's brigade but 235, and Ransom's casualties had been 534. The toll on the entire Confederate left, from McClaws's division to the end of the line, including Kemper's and Jenkins's brigades, had not exceeded 1676. Light as were the losses of the Confederates, contrasted with those of the Federals, the sight of so much human woe would have been intolerable had it not been relieved by episodes that made the burial details laugh even as they shuddered. One Confederate private, who had picked up a fine Belgian rifle that lay on the ground among the dead, was reprimanded by a Federal major. Nobody, the Union officer said, could salvage arms during a truce. The Confederate continued on his way, heedless of the officer, until his eye chanced to light on the Federal's fine boots. Never mind, he said, I'll shoot you tomorrow and get them boots. Another Confederate stopped on the field to take a pair of shoes from the feet of a Federal who lay prone and apparently dead. While he was removing one shoe, he was startled to see the man lift his head reproachfully. The Confederate carefully put the man's foot back on the ground. Beg pardon, sir, he said, I thought you had gone above. By the time this polite ghoul and his comrades had come back into the lines, Lee was suspicious that Burnside was about to retire in order to undertake a new advance somewhere else on the Rappahannock, but still he could not convince himself that an adversary who had done so much boasting and had made so many preparations could afford to withdraw. Lee waited on the lines till a south wind sprang up and a rain began to fall during the evening. Then, in frank perplexity, he returned to his headquarters at Hamilton's Crossing. The rain was still falling and the morning was dark when he started to the front again on the 16th. As on the previous morning since Burnside had advanced across the Rappahannock, the haze was so thick that nothing of the enemy's whereabouts could be seen, not even when Lee rode to the right once again to reconnoiter from Jackson's front. With Stonewall, he went up to the eminence near the railroad whence he had observed the silent army resting on the morning of the 14th with not a single flag flying. D. H. Hill was on the ground, talking with Colonel Brian Grimes. Hill met them with the announcement that the enemy had disappeared from his front. Who says they are gone? Jackson demanded.
Colonel Grimes, Hill said. How do you know? Jackson asked the colonel. I have been down as far as their picket line of yesterday, Grimes answered, and can see nothing of them. Move your skirmish line as far as the line, Jackson ordered, and see where they are. Lee said nothing, but Grimes observed how deep was the chagrin and humiliation with which he and Jackson received the news. The report was true. Under cover of the darkness, with the south wind shutting off all sound from the southern lines, Burnside had retreated and had removed his bridges. It had been an easy task and Lee felt that it could not have been prevented. Had I divined that was to have been his only effort, he said of Burnside, he would have had more of it. And again, in disappointment, the enemy suffered heavily as far as the battle went, but it did not go far enough to satisfy me. The contest will have now to be renewed, but on what field I cannot say. He was deeply depressed that he had not been able to strike a decisive blow. We had really accomplished nothing, we had not gained a foot of ground, and I knew the enemy could easily replace the men he had lost, thus he reviewed the campaign months afterwards. The army and the country shared his chagrin. Although there were some signs that the Federals were moving for the Potomac, Lee's expectation was that Burnside would soon cross the river again, probably at Port Royal, in which case he planned to reconcentrate in the enemy's front and to give battle anew. If the Federals slipped over the line of the Rappahannock unopposed, and that would not be difficult on so long a line, then Lee intended to withdraw to the North Anna and meet him there. That was all. There was no pride in the quick discovery of Burnside's plan to move from Warrenton to Fredericksburg, no boasting that an army of 78,000 had blocked the advance of 125,000 Federals on the Confederate capital and had captured 11,000 stands of arms. No rejoicing that the great preparations of the enemy had been set at naught with casualties nearly two and a half times those the Army of Northern Virginia had sustained. There was only regret that more had not been done. Slowly and sorrowfully, by the now familiar road, he made his way back to headquarters on the 16th and sat himself down to write Mrs. Lee about the battle and to discuss with her their plans for helping the Arlington Negroes whom he was soon to manumit under the will of Mr. Custis. Chapter 32 The First Warnings of Coming Ruin Burnside's withdrawal across the Rappahannock left Lee in doubt as to the future intentions of his adversary, though he was satisfied that the Army of the Potomac would soon advance again. When a week passed without any movement by the enemy, he sent Stuart and 1,800 of his cavalry to scout on the north side of the river to assail the enemy's communications and to ascertain his dispositions. While Stuart was away, the army passed a bleak Christmas in such shelters as the men had been able to find on the heights and in the woods. Lee spent the forenoon in writing letters. My heart, he told Mrs. Lee, is filled with gratitude to Almighty God for his unspeakable mercies with which he has blessed us in this day, for those he has granted us from the beginning of life, and particularly for those he has vouchsafed us during the past year. What should have become of us without his crowning help and protection? Oh, if our people would only recognize it and cease from vain self-boasting and adulation, how strong would be my belief in final success and happiness to our country. But what a cruel thing is war, to separate and destroy families and friends, and mar the purest joys and happiness God has granted us in this world, to fill our hearts with hatred instead of love for our neighbors, and to devastate the fair face of this beautiful world. I pray that, on this day when only peace and goodwill are preached to mankind, better thoughts may fill the hearts of our enemies and turn them to peace. To his daughter Mildred he wrote in less serious strain, with a touch of homesickness in his heart, but he concluded with the assurance, I am happy in the knowledge that General Burnside and his army will not eat their promised Christmas dinner in Richmond today. For his own dinner he went by invitation to Jackson's headquarters, where the doughty Stonewall entertained him, Pendleton, and their staffs. Jackson had received many presents of food from admirers and was able to spread a sumptuous table, not forgetting to have his waiters appear in white aprons. This fastidious touch, in such a setting, appealed to Lee's sense of humor. Jackson and his lieutenants, he said, were playing at soldier. They must come and dine with him to see how real soldiers lived. His great lieutenant, of course, was both pleased and confused at Lee's comments. The last week in December passed uneventfully, except for fatigue duty in strengthening the fortifications on Mary's Heights. On the 29th, Lee executed the deed of manumission for the Custis slaves, taking pains to include all the Negroes he could remember.
Two days later, on the last day of the year, he published to the army his congratulatory order on the outcome of the Battle of Fredericksburg. In this, he warned the men that new duties lay ahead. The war is not yet ended, said he. The enemy is still numerous and strong, and the country demands of the army a renewal of its heroic efforts in her behalf. Nobly has it responded to her call in the past, and she will never appeal in vain to its courage and patriotism. The signal manifestations of divine mercy that have distinguished the eventful and glorious campaign of the year just closing give assurance of hope that, under the guidance of the same Almighty Hand, the coming year will be no less fruitful of events that will ensure the safety, peace and happiness of our beloved country and add new luster to the already imperishable name of the Army of Northern Virginia. This final flourish showed the hand of Major Charles Marshall rather than that of Lee. The year had, indeed, been one of victory in Virginia, at least during the seven months Lee had commanded the army. Port Republic, Cross Keys, Mechanicsville, Gaines's Mill, Savage Station, Fraser's Farm, Malvern Hill, Cedar Mountain, Second Manassas, Boonesboro, Harper's Ferry, Sharpsburg, and Fredericksburg, thirteen battles great and small, had been fought during that time, and the Confederates had remained masters of the field in every instance except at Boonesboro and at Sharpsburg. Leaving out of account the actions at Cross Keys, Port Republic, and Cedar Mountain, which were tactically Jackson's though Lee had a part in the general strategy, the troops under Lee's command had this account of gains and losses, they had sustained 48,171 casualties and had inflicted 70,725. They had taken from the enemy approximately 75,000 small arms and had yielded scarcely more than 6,000. With the loss of eight cannon, they had secured 155. The infantry practically had been rearmed with improved, captured rifles, and half the batteries boasted superior ordnance that had belonged to the Army of the Potomac. The morale of the Army of Northern Virginia was vastly higher than it had been when Lee took command, yet there was a consciousness in the ranks, though not in the Richmond executive offices, of the persistent, determined spirit of an enemy who could replace every fallen soldier, make good every captured arm, and supply every necessity of the Army of the Potomac from ample manufactories and open ports. Richmond was fearful of military defeat but refused to admit the inevitable consequences of economic attrition. The Army of Northern Virginia was confident of victory in the field but fearful of economic disaster behind the lines. Before the winter was to end, the danger of starvation and of immobility resulting from a collapse of transportation was to be plain to every private in the ranks. The improvement in organization wrought after July was amazing. Gone were the excitable Magruder, the slow Huger, the gloomy Whiting, and the deaf Holmes. Gone was the cumbersome old arrangement of divisions, operating as if they had been independent armies. In its place were two well-administered corps, commanded by officers of proved capacity. The divisions and brigades were becoming conscious of their relation to the military machine and were led, in most instances, by men who relied on sound tactics and good discipline rather than on the costly valor of untrained soldiers. Fifteen of the brigadier generals who had entered the Seven Days' battle with Lee were no longer present to issue his congratulatory order to their men on the last day of 1862. Some of the best of the fifteen had been killed, notably Garland, Gregg, and Winder, but the incompetence had in part been supplanted and the political generals had been sent elsewhere, and all so quietly, so tactfully, that few realized how the army had been transformed by the time the men tumbled out of their blankets and wished one another a happy new year at roll call on the morning of January 1, 1863. Stuart came back from his raid that first day of the month, bringing with him about two hundred prisoners and some plunder. He had stories of gallant encounters near Dumfries and around Occoquan to tell, but he had no definite news of the enemy's dispositions or plans. Uninformed, in the midst of bitter weather, Lee had to await the next move of his adversary and, meantime, had to give serious thought to the threatened development of a new attack in North Carolina. The Federals had, at that time, a small force at Suffolk, Virginia, 16 miles west of Norfolk, and an army of unknown strength in eastern North Carolina. On December 11, 1862, Major General John G. A. Foster, federal commander of the Department of North Carolina, had left New Bern with 10,000 troops and had occupied Kinston on the 14th. After driving back a small opposing Confederate force, he had pushed on to Goldsboro, which he reached on the 17th. He had burned an important railroad bridge on the Weldon and Wilmington line and had torn up for miles of track.
Although he had retreated promptly to New Bern, his raid had created profound apprehension not only in eastern North Carolina but in Richmond as well. It was feared that he might cut the communications between the capital and the South, and, if reinforced, might move on Richmond from the South. There was a suspicion, also, that the operations against Goldsboro were a feint and that the main objective might be Wilmington. This was Lee's opinion. To afford immediate protection, he started Ransom's division southward on January 3rd and decided to place Major General D. H. Hill at the disposal of the government in rallying the people of North Carolina. There was a demand that Lee visit the state to study the enemy's movements, but he did not feel that he could leave the Rappahannock until General Burnside's intentions were more fully disclosed. In case Burnside retired, he believed it would be practicable to send part of his army to North Carolina and, with the rest, to clear the Valley of Virginia, where he had consolidated the command under Brigadier General W. E. Jones, who had one brigade of cavalry. On January 14, Lee ordered D. H. Hill to Richmond, and on the 16th he went there in person, at Mr. Davis's request, to confer on the situation. He found the administration concerned over the immediate outlook but confident that the war should soon be won, an optimistic delusion he did not share. At the instance of the president, he agreed to detach two brigades for service in North Carolina. Before any further decision was reached, Lee was hurriedly recalled to Fredericksburg by the news that Burnside's army was on the move and seemed to be threatening to cross the Rappahannock. When he reached headquarters on the 18th, Lee found Jackson and Longstreet at odds concerning the disposition of the army for the expected attack. Quickly settling this, he spent two busy days riding to the left and to the right of the line, and concluded, in the end, that the enemy's effort would be on the upper Rappahannock, above Fredericksburg. Meantime, of necessity, he had suspended the movement of the two brigades that were to be sent to North Carolina, though he assured Mr. Davis that he would dispatch them if the president thought there was greater need of them in North Carolina than with the Army of Northern Virginia, a position he always assumed when calls were made on him for troops. Signs multiplied by January 20 that the enemy again was preparing to adventure across the Rappahannock. In a heavy rain, the shivering Confederate troops remained on the alert. Lee himself was anxious about the enemy's movements and was not hopeful that he would be able to prevent a crossing at some point on his long, exposed line. In case Burnside eluded him he would hold to his plan of withdrawing toward the North Anna in order to reconcentrate his army, a course that Mr. Davis was anxious that he avoid if possible. Two days, three days passed without action. There were new signs of activity below Fredericksburg and then once more above the city. At length, following a heavy snowstorm on January 2729, all federal activity ended, and Lee concluded that because of the weather or for other reasons, Burnside's attempt had been frustrated. He was correct. The federal commander had contemplated a general offensive, but had found the roads so nearly bottomless that his advance had degenerated into what his disgusted army styled a mud march. During the five weeks that had separated the beginning of the mud march from Burnside's defeat at Fredericksburg, Lee had been fortifying the entire front of the Rappahannock. After the mud march, he had this work continued on the whole line of 25 miles from Banks's Ford to Port Royal. The world has never seen such a fortified position, one enthusiastic artillerist wrote after the system of defense had been completed. The famous lines at Torres Vedras could not compare with them. They follow the contour of the ground and hug the bases of the hills as they win to and from the river, thus giving natural flanking arrangements, and from the tops of the hills frown the redoubts for sunken batteries and barbette batteries ad libitum, far exceeding the number of our guns, while occasionally, where the trenches take straight across the flats, a redoubt stands out defiantly in the open plain to receive our howitzers. These fortifications marked a definite stage in the evolution of the field defenses that were to be one of Lee's most historic contributions to the science of war. The ease with which some of the Fredericksburg defenses were thrown up and the adequacy of the cover they afforded the army were not forgotten. From this type of work, there was only one step to field fortification. While the dirt was flying and the lines were daily growing stronger, Lee was warning an overconfident administration that the next few months might be decisive. The enemy, he said, will make every effort to crush us between now and June, and it will require all our strength to resist him.
he renewed his perennial appeal for the completion of the Richmond defenses, he had the line of the North Anna examined by officers who reported against a prolonged defense there, he exhausted his arguments and almost exhausted his patience in trying to end wasteful details and to bring men into the ranks. At no time during the war was his language more vigorous. More than once, he wrote the Secretary of War, have most promising opportunities been lost for one of men to take advantage of them, and victory itself has been made to put on the appearance of defeat because our diminished and exhausted troops have been unable to renew a successful struggle against fresh numbers of the enemy. The lives of our soldiers are too precious to be sacrificed in the attainment of successes that inflict no loss upon the enemy beyond the actual loss in battle. In view of the vast increase of the forces of the enemy, of the savage and brutal policy he has proclaimed, which leaves us no alternative but success or degradation worse than death, if we would save the honor of our families from pollution, our social system from destruction, let every effort be made, every means be employed, to fill and maintain the ranks of our armies, until God, in his mercy, shall bless us with the establishment of our independence. Congress's failure to act aroused to indignation even a nature that had been disciplined from boyhood to respect civil authority. Our salvation will depend on the next four months, he said prophetically, and yet I cannot get even regular promotions made to fill vacancies in regiments, while Congress seems to be laboring to pass laws to get easy places for some favorites or constituents or get others out of active service. I shall feel very much obliged if they will pass a law relieving me from all duty and legislating someone in my place, better able to do it. Again he wrote hotly, what has our Congress done to meet the exigency, I may say extremity, in which we are placed? As far as I know, concocted bills to excuse a certain class of men from service and to transfer another class in service out of active service, where they hope never to do service. Regardless of the remissness of the lawmakers, Lee's apprehension of a new crisis kept him from resting, inactive, behind his cavalry outposts, which were extended by this time from Beverly's Ford on the upper Rappahannock far down the river to the watershed between the Rappahannock and the Pamunkey. With the energy that always surged under his calm exterior, he now turned his attention to General R. H. Milroy. That officer, or someone misusing his name, was putting into effect in parts of Western Virginia a system of organized blackmail, almost unique in character. Southern sympathizers were notified that loss had been inflicted on Union supporters and that an assessment had been levied against them to make this good. Formal notice of the assessment was accompanied by extracts from an official order of General Milroy announcing that if the recipient did not pay, his house was to be burned, his property seized, and himself shot. Under this arbitrary system, it was believed that $6,000 had been wrung from Southern sympathizers in Tucker County alone. In addition, General Milroy had issued an order requiring all citizens to notify him of the approach of Confederate troops on pain of death and the destruction of their houses. General Lee had protested to General Halleck against these orders, which Halleck had disavowed, but Lee was anxious that the author of such threats be driven from Virginia. From Confederates there came complaints that Brigadier General W. E. Jones, whom Lee had named to command in the valley, had not been active in dealing with Milroy's raiders. Lee had defended Jones, whose difficulties he understood, and he now resolved to detach Fitz Lee's brigade of cavalry to reinforce Jones for an attack on Milroy. Just at the time when this expedition was moving through the mud toward the valley on February 14, a fleet of federal transports, loaded with men, steamed down the Potomac. The troops were suspected to be the Nine Corps and their probable destination, Lee thought, was Charleston, where he now expected the next federal blow to fall, instead of at Wilmington. There was, however, probability that the destination might be southeastern Virginia and the objective Richmond or the railroad leading to it from the south. Lee had already discussed with the president the advisability of sending troops to the exposed railway line of communications through North Carolina, and on call from Richmond he now ordered Pickett with his division of the 1st Corps to start for Richmond on the 15th, Hood was put on the alert to follow Pickett. Not knowing whether the federal movement presaged a change of base, Lee directed Stewart to make a reconnaissance when the column intended for the valley reached Culpeper. If Stewart then discovered signs of any general retirement of the Federals, he was to operate at once on their lines of communication and was to suspend the expedition into the Shenandoah area. As reports immediately indicated a concentration at Newport News, Lee ordered Hood to follow Pickett to Richmond and, after he was informed, on the 17th, that a third corps was moving down the Potomac, he directed Longstreet to proceed southward and take command of the two detached divisions.
He left the disposition of these troops to the War Department, but he directed them temporarily to camp near Richmond until the plan of the enemy should be more fully disclosed. The departure of Longstreet left Lee with a total force not exceeding 62,600 officers and men, of whom only 58,800 were on the line of the Rappahannock. Yet Lee's chief regret was that he could not take the offensive against the diminished federal command opposing him. He wrote the president, the most lamentable part of the present condition of things is the impossibility of attacking them with any prospect of advantage. The rivers and streams are all swollen beyond fording, we have no bridges, and the roads are in a liquid state and nearly impracticable. In addition, our horses and mules are in that reduced state that the labor and exposure incident to an attack would result in their destruction and leave us destitute of the means of transportation. General Joseph Hooker had now replaced General Burnside in command of the Army of the Potomac, a change that Lee accepted with complacency. In his personal letters he jested mildly over the apparent inability of Hooker to determine on a course of action. General Hooker is obliged to do something, he wrote one of his daughters on February 6. I do not know what it will be. He is playing the Chinese game, trying what frightening will do. He runs out his guns, starts wagons and troops up and down the river, and creates an excitement generally. Our men look on in wonder, give a cheer, and all again subsides in statu quo antebellum. That is, the state existing before the war, later in the month, when a foot of snow brought new hardship to the men, he complained to Mrs. Lee, I owe Mr. Fighting Joe Hooker no thanks for keeping me here. He ought to have made up his mind what to do. By February 26, Lee concluded that Hooker had decided to do nothing on a large scale until the weather improved. Rest in winter quarters became more of a reality, though the army was not free of all activity. Lee held to his rule not to embarrass private families by crowding himself and his staff into nearby homes. He usually camped near Longstreet in order to hasten the movements of that leisurely general, and after Longstreet left for Southside Virginia, he remained in the little clearing in the woods on the mine road to Hamilton's Crossing. His tents were few in number and had nothing to indicate that they were the headquarters of an army, except for a flag in front of the tent of Major Taylor. The wagon stood unparked, the horses were tethered in good weather or sheltered in crude bowers against the storms. No sentinel stood at Lee's tent except when he was engaged. Inside were his Spartan camp equipment, his military desk, and a small stove. His most frequent guest was a hen that requited his hospitality by laying an egg regularly under his cot. Other guests of different species were numerous. Robert came more frequently than before, bringing reports, for he had been promoted lieutenant and had become aide to Rooney, his brother. As the brigade he commanded was usually at a distance, Rooney came rarely. The sons and other guests, formal and familiar, were entertained occasionally at dinner, but with no pretense of a well-furnished table. In December, 1862, when Lord Hartington, Colonel Leslie, and Francis Lawley of the London Times had been delayed by Jackson's hospitality and had arrived at Lee's quarters long after the hour set for a repast in their honor, they found that the general had finished his simple meal and was relieved, rather than fretted, because they had come late. Gentlemen, he said, I hope Jackson has given you a good dinner, and if so, I am very glad things have turned out as they have, for I had given the invitation without knowing the poor state of my mess provisions and should scarcely have been able to offer you anything. Whether entertaining or visiting, inspecting or in council, Lee sought during that stern winter to set an example of good cheer and to keep high the spirits of his lieutenants. From no other period of the war have so many diverting stories survived. He was very fond of teasing his messmates and the handsome young officers whom he met on his rounds. Once, in the fall, when he had heard Stuart's famous banjo player, Sweeney, amusing a company of officers in front of his tent, he had come out to express his thanks and had observed a jug of liquor sitting rather conspicuously on a boulder. Gentlemen, he had said, am I to thank General Stuart or the jug for this fine music? One day, a little later, when a similar vessel had been observed in his own tent, he had come out to ask his staff if they would like a glass of something. Willingly and expectantly they followed him inside. He had his mess steward, Brian, place glasses on the table, and then he told them to serve the officers. Brian obediently pulled the cork, while lips were smacked expectantly.
With the air of one who might have been dispensing a king's best burgundy, he solemnly poured out to each a glass of buttermilk. Complaints of hard living he turned off with a jest. When a young officer protested that the biscuits were unconscionably tough, Lee looked at him reassuringly. You ought not to mind that, he said, they will stick by you the longer. Major von Bork, of Stuart's staff, had been compelled, after Fredericksburg, to buy a carriage in order to get a span of horses he had admired. Being thrifty, von Bork sought to make the carriage do duty as a baggage wagon. Lee rarely met the German Goliath that he did not ask, Major, where's your carriage? A little later, when von Bork chanced to be with him while a minor engagement was in progress, Lee remarked dryly, if we only had your carriage, what a splendid opportunity to charge the enemy with it. Hood was another with whom Lee liked to joke. From his nearby camp, Hood called one day when the general chanced to be talking with Colonel Chilton about the depredations of the soldiers in burning fence rails and stealing pigs. Hood, somewhat self-righteously, felt called upon to defend his division against such a charge. Lee let him finish, and then he said, Ah, General Hood, when you Texans come about, the chickens have to roost mighty high. It was Jackson, however, that Lee, in common with Jeb Stewart and Longstreet, was most prone to tease. Going to the vicinity of Hayfield with Jackson, he called on its mistress, his kinswoman, Mrs. W. P. Taylor. Two young ladies were present with Mr. and Mrs. Taylor to welcome him and his companions. Lee announced that he had brought his great generals along for the young ladies to see and had allowed the young officers to come along in order that they might see the ladies. To Mrs. Taylor he confided in that officer's presence that Jackson was one of the most cruel and inhuman of men. At the Battle of Fredericksburg, he went on, it had been all he could do to keep Jackson from putting bayonets on the guns of his men and driving all those people into the river. Mrs. Taylor forthrightly answered that she had always heard that General Jackson was a good Christian man and that she hoped if those people ever crossed at Hayfield, General Lee would not do anything to keep Jackson from driving them back. One of the little children at a river plantation sometimes visited by Lee considered him her confidant. She would always come up to kiss him and at last whispered to him that she wanted to kiss General Jackson, too. When Lee repeated this, Stonewall was as much confused as if a dazzling Richmond Bell had threatened to embrace him. On another visit, when the same little girl came up to greet him, Lee suggested that she would show better taste if she kissed one of the younger officers. There is the handsome Major Pelham, he said, pointing to Stuart's renowned young artillerist, who blushed in a manner to rival Jackson. Much as Lee delighted to tease his comrades, he was sensitive to their hardships and unfailing in his consideration for them. Stewart's staff had not forgotten how sympathetically he had talked with Mrs. Stewart in November when he had heard of the loss of her little boy, and almost every officer had some special kindness to cherish. In the midst of a snowstorm, answering a summons from Lee, Jackson rode over one night, accompanied by an aide, Captain J. P. Smith. Lee was almost angry that Jackson had exposed himself and Smith to the rigors of the weather when nothing would have been lost by waiting until the storm was over. After Jackson had gone with him into his tent, Lee came out several times to be sure that his staff officers were making Captain Smith comfortable. Stuart was a constant concern to Lee because his reckless courage led him to expose himself needlessly. Lee depended on him more than on anyone else for information as to the enemy's movements, no other officer seemed to have quite the same ability to peer at a distant column from a hilltop and to say how strong it was and whither it was bound. Such a man was irreplaceable, and Lee knew it. Often he ended official letters to Stuart with warnings against unnecessary risks. A characteristic conclusion to his orders for a hazardous enterprise was commending you to a kindly providence and your own good judgment. Lee's own staff officers shared his sympathy precisely as they had to endure his teasing. One of their number was not especially diligent, and his disposition to take his duties lightly increased the labor of the others. Occasionally, some of them felt that the general was inclined to put the burden on those who would bear it and to allow the shirker to go unrebuked. Lee's known aversion to spending time over routine official papers occasionally created unpleasant situations. During the autumn before Fredericksburg, Major Taylor had come into Lee's tent when the general had been in a bad humor. Before the work had fairly begun, Lee had been jerking his head and neck in the familiar manner that showed rising anger. Taylor petulantly had thrown the paper down at his side and had silently defied his chief. 
Instantly Lee had gripped himself and in perfect calmness, with measured tones had said, Major Taylor, when I lose my temper, don't let it make you angry. There was much to do at winter quarters besides keeping the officers in good spirits. Correspondence was heavy. Lee not only wrote out in person most of his confidential dispatches, but also penned many brief papers to save the time and labor of others. He acknowledged in his autograph every present sent him, from a mattress to a prayer book. With pains and sympathy, he addressed, besides, numerous friends whose kinsmen had fallen in the army. One such letter from Hamilton's Crossing was to his old companion, Dr. Orlando Fairfax, whose magnificent young son had fallen at Fredericksburg, a private in the ranks. Another similar letter went to Howell Cobb on the death of the brother who had commanded in the sunken road at Mary's Heights. Still a third was sent to Governor F. W. Pickens of South Carolina on the loss of General Gregg. The death of such a man, Lee said, is a costly sacrifice, for it is to men of his high integrity and commanding intellect that the country must look to give character to her counsels, that she may be respected and honored by all nations. The never-ending tasks of reorganization likewise consumed much time in winter quarters. The campaigns of 1862 had developed some friction between Jackson and Lee's headquarters staff and had shown a number of weaknesses in the law governing staff organization. The chairman of the Senate Committee on Military Affairs, which was seeking to amend the act, wrote Lee to ask his opinion of the proposed legislation. Lee answered in detail and, knowing the sensitiveness of the president, took care to outline to him in a separate letter his views of the necessary changes. He did not attempt to draw a legal line between the general staff and the personal staff of officers in the field. Instead, he explained that the aides of a general officer need not be numerous, as the general staff could usually assist on the field of battle when the duties of the aides were heaviest. At other times, the officers of the general staff were busier than a general's aides. His main insistence was twofold. First, he argued for equality of rank for the heads of the various staff bureaus serving with a given army unit. Each division of the staff, he argued, in the second place, should be a complete organization in itself, so that it can maneuver independently of the corps or division to which it is habitually attached and be attached with promptness and facility when required. If you can then fill these positions with proper officers, not the relatives and social friends of the commanders, who, however agreeable their company, are not always the most useful, you might hope to have the finest army in the world. The legislation, which was shaped substantially as Lee recommended, was not adopted until June, 1864, but as far as existing statutes permitted, Lee anticipated it and proceeded to reorganize the army staff during the winter of 1862-1863. The benefits were soon observable, though he did not succeed in destroying the nests of nepotism that some of the civilization and brigade commanders had established at their headquarters. The artillery was reorganized along with the staff. Lee had long doubted the wisdom of attaching batteries permanently to the smaller units, and in February, 1863, he had General Pendleton work out a plan for the establishment of artillery battalions of four batteries each. These battalions were to be assigned to the corps, not to the brigades or to the divisions, and were to be employed as needed. The general reserve was to be reduced to six batteries. At the head of the whole force, which amounted to 264 guns, was to be an army chief of artillery reporting directly to the commanding general. Over the battalions attached to each corps was to be a chief of artillery for that corps. A much-emphasized feature of the plan was the provision of two field officers for each battalion, one a lieutenant colonel and the other a major. Lee assumed that one of these officers would be busy in the general direction of the unit and that the other would be needed to place the guns. As he explained to President Davis, if you do not have an officer of judgment and experience to send for which, to select the position, prepare the way, etc., the captains have to leave their batteries or lead them blindly forward. A captain should always be with his battery. The plan was approved, and the choice of men was debated with much care and not without some heat on Jackson's part. A new statute, enacted to facilitate the reorganization, allowed a brigadier general for each 80 guns, or three for the army. Lee was not satisfied that his friend Pendleton had all the qualifications for army chief of artillery. 
Instead, he recommended that General Arnold Elzey, if his health and habits permitted, should be chief, that Pendleton should become head of the artillery of the Second Corps, and that Colonel A. L. Long of his staff, who had shown great skill in handling ordnance, should be promoted chief of artillery of Longstreet's Corps, though he recognized the difficulties involved in promoting a staff officer to that position. The president preferred not to disturb the existing assignments and deferred action on the selection of three brigadier generals for the artillery. The battalion organization, however, became effective before the opening of the campaign of 1863. The management of the artillery arm was much improved by the change. The exchange of six-pounder guns for new 12-pounders, in accordance with a plan of recasting that Lee had formulated in the autumn of 1862, also contributed much to improve the artillery. Far more serious than reorganization of staff and gunners was the shortage of horses and the danger that lack of forage would cause the death of many of those that had survived the long campaign from Mechanicsville to Fredericksburg. Every horse with the army had to be conserved and additional animals had to be provided because the heavier cannon would demand larger teams. The specter of a paralyzing shortage of horses was already haunting the mind of Lee. He mentioned the condition of the animals as one of the chief reasons why he could not take the offensive after the detachment of troops from the Army of the Potomac in February and from the labor he expended in trying to save the Army's horses during the winter of 1862-1863. There can be little doubt that even then he saw in the prospective failure of the horse supply one of the most serious obstacles to the establishment of Southern independence. Some 600 or 700 mules had been purchased in the Trans-Mississippi Department and were being wintered at Alexandria, Louisiana. 400 artillery horses had been procured in Georgia but had not been brought nearer than North Carolina because they could not be foraged with the army. These were all that could be counted upon to supplement the gaunt and jaded animals with the trains, except, of course, for such additional horses as could be picked up in the unplundered sections of nearby states. The country immediately adjacent to the army had been so completely swept of fodder that as soon as the first threat of a new offensive had passed after the Battle of Fredericksburg, he had ordered the whole of the artillery to the rear, except twelve batteries. All the draft horses that could possibly be spared thereafter were sent back from the Rappahannock, some of them as far south as Brunswick County, which lies on the North Carolina border. When Pickett and Hood went to Richmond, Lee was so fearful the artillery horses would break down that he suggested the guns be forwarded by train and the animals be led through the country. The quartermaster of the artillery scoured the line of the Virginia Central for fodder and grain to increase the limited supply brought by rail from Richmond. Rooney Lee's cavalry brigade was foraged miles from the right of the line, in Essex and Middlesex counties, though it had to get its meat from the northern neck counties across the Rappahannock. The transportation of the army was reduced to the absolute minimum, but even then it was admitted that many of the horses would have to suffer. As the late spring held back the grass, Lee was compelled on April 6, when the advance of the enemy was only a matter of days, to warn Pendleton not to bring up his teams from the south more rapidly than he could find feed for them. The danger to the cavalry from the shortage of feed was every whit as serious as the threatened paralysis of the artillery. The army would be feeble without artillery, but it would be blind without cavalry. The superiority of the Confederate mounted forces, a potent factor in the operations of 1862, was not only challenged, but was in danger of being lost completely. Hampton had been detached and sent southward to recruit, primarily because his horses could not remain with the main army and be supplied. The position of W. E. Jones and that of Rooney Lee have been described. Fitz Lee, who contrived to subsist his men and horses where Hamptons had been in danger of starvation, covered the left flank of the army from the Blue Ridge to the Rapidan. These two brigades were all that Lee had with him during the late winter. Repeatedly through the dark months, by letter and in person, he asked for reinforcements, and as the time for the opening of the campaign approached, he besought the president to find him two more brigades, though he could not graze their mounts and therefore could not order them up until the spring opened, even if they were made available. Tragic as it was to see the faithful animals of the army die for lack of forage, and bitter as were the unescapable reflections of Lee on what might happen the next winter, he had daily to face a worse condition in the hunger of his own men. Provisions came to the Rappahannock from Richmond by a single-track railroad that was far from regular in its delivery of cars. The nearby country supplied almost nothing. Because of the condition of the horses, only a limited number of wagons could be sent into distant counties to collect provisions there.
As early as January 5, Lee doubted whether starvation might not prove a more potent foe than the Army of the Potomac, and thereafter he had to resort to every expedient to keep even a few days ahead of actual hunger in the ranks. Colonel Cole, the chief commissary, went to Richmond to plead with the authorities and brought back many promises, but no provisions. Such beeves as were sent forward were generally so thin that Lee had to ask that they be kept to fatten in the spring, and that salt meat be issued instead. Cavalry were used to supplement the government agents in collecting cattle, the commander of a proposed expedition to cut the bee, and oh, railroad was told that the meat he might bring back was as important as the damage he might inflict, wagons were furnished to haul to the railroad the wheat purchased by the commissary, appeals to the public were urged on the president by Lee, the dispatch of men to collect grain along the James River and Kanawha Canal was suggested, the War Department was importune to send men southward along the railroads to hasten the movement of supply trains, a report that there was beef in Florida was instantly hurried to the president. Scurvy began to appear, at the first signs of spring in the woods the soldiers were sent out to collect sassafras buds, onions, and other wild vegetation. Vigorous warning was issued that the men must not damage growing crops on which their subsistence might depend. At a time when 100 cars of sugar, intended for the army, were reported to have stood more than a fortnight on sidings in North Carolina, the soldiers went without that item of food for 10 days. Their ration, Lee wrote Seddon, consists of one-fourth pound of bacon, 18 ounces of flour, 10 pounds of rice to each 100 men about every third day, with some few peas and a small amount of dried fruit occasionally as they can be obtained. This may give existence to the troops while idle, but will certainly cause them to break down when called upon for exertion. This was only two weeks before the beginning of the Chancellorsville campaign. Still later, when any day, any hour, might see the Federals on the move, Lee had to write the secretary, I am painfully anxious lest the spirit and efficiency of the men should become impaired and they be rendered unable to sustain their former reputation or perform the service necessary for our safety. Lee's appeals and warnings alike failed to do more than to keep the army alive. Admitting that the shortage of food was due chiefly to a lack of railroad transportation or to the right use of it, Mr. Seddon was unable to overcome the gloomy contrariness of the Commissary General, Colonel L. B. in Northrop. This strange man, though he had the full confidence of Mr. Davis, had the singular faculty of keeping every army commander in a state of constant indignation. He is, in fact, one of the few functionaries of the period whose letters, read after seventy years, irritate if they do not actually outrage the historian. Convinced that his own methods were right and were thwarted by the stupidity or opposition of the generals in the field, he took refuge in interminable letters of explanation when he was asked why the army was starving. He seemed satisfied if he could demonstrate that he was on record as predicting what had come to pass. By his own enigmatic code, he had rather be consistent than efficient. Lee corresponded with him no more frequently than necessity compelled, but he was angered by the mismanagement against ever-mounting odds. Northrop, for his part, had a grudge against Lee, first because the general would not reduce the army ration as Northrop desired and, secondly, because Lee had failed to accord an interview to a civilian whom Northrop had sent to his headquarters with a scheme for collecting supplies by utilizing the transportation of the army. Whatever the dereliction of which he was accused, no matter how desperate the plight of the Army of Northern Virginia, Northrop rarely failed to hark back to one or the other of his grievances against Lee. The months brought no better understanding. Any experienced soldier could see by this time that war weariness and the unhindered misdirection of an essential bureau by such a man as Northrop, regardless of other factors, might ultimately bring defeat at the hands of a stronger adversary. In Lee's letters of the winter of 186263 there is, however, not a hint that he knew he was championing a hopeless cause. Doubtless he shut his mind to speculation on the outcome and sought simply to do his duty while leaving the rest to God. The cruel shortage of provisions was sharpened by the severities of an unusually bleak and frigid winter. For a part of the men blankets were lacking even in January. Shoes were bad, especially those of English manufacture. Yet the men somehow contrived to keep from freezing. Many built huts for themselves with chimneys of sticks and mud, others found a way to make themselves decently comfortable in tents by erecting chimneys or by procuring a stove, as Lee did. There were snow battles for excitement, theatricals for amusements, and religious meetings for spiritual comfort. The revival that had begun in the lower valley after the return of the army from Maryland spread from brigade to brigade.
religious leaders from the southern cities joined with the chaplains in preaching to men whose religious impulses had been awakened by the nearness of death. General Lee took deep interest in these meetings, conferred often with the chaplains and attended service whenever he could. As a low churchman, there was nothing alien to him in the emotional evangelism that marked most of the discourses. On the contrary, he and Jackson, sitting side by side on a log, were moved to tears one Sunday by the affecting eloquence with which Rev. B. T. Lacey described the homes from which the army had been drawn. Music added its cheer. Most of the Confederate bands were notoriously bad, but they were industrious. It was while the two armies were close together, not long after the Battle of Fredericksburg, that an excellent federal band came down to the river bank and began, as General Sorrell has written, playing pretty airs, among them the northern patriotic chants and war songs. Now give us some of ours, shouted our pickets, and at once the music swelled into Dixie, My Maryland, and the Bonnie Blue Flag. Then, after a mighty cheer, a slight pause, the band began again, all listening, this time it was the tender melting bars of home, sweet home, and on both sides of the river there were joyous shouts, and many wet eyes could be found among those hardy warriors under the flags. Humor had its place with religion and music. Along with pranks and bones mows, the standing joke of the Confederate army did hourly duty in a hundred forms, a cavalryman comes rejoicing in immense top boots, for which in fond pride he has invested full forty dollars of pay, at once the cry from a hundred voices follows him along the line, come out of them boots. Come out! Too soon to go into winter quarters. I know you're in thar. See your arms sticking out. A bumpkin rides by in an uncommonly big hat, and is frightened by the shout, Come down out o' oh, that hat. Come down! Tain't no use to say you ain't up there, I see your legs hanging out. A fancy staff officer was horrified at the irreverent reception of his nice twisted mustache, as he heard from innumerable trees, Take the mice out o' oh, your mouth. Take em out. No use to say they ain't thar. See their tails hanging out. Another, sporting immense whiskers, was urged to come out of that bunch of har. I know you're in thar. I see your ears a-working. Lee's consideration for the rights of the private soldier strengthened the morale which the unfailing humor of the troops expressed. If a man were caught within the enemy's lines and unjustly accused of being a spy, the general would exert himself to the utmost to save him from execution. He was always willing to request information regarding a prisoner or the return of a dead captive if the family desired it. During the winter, a court-martial condemned to death a private who had deserted on receipt of a distressing letter from his wife. When he reached home and his wife found that he had come without leave, she sent him back. Lee confirmed the sentence of death but had the man pardoned promptly. The circumstances, which appealed to the imagination of homesick boys, redounded as much to Lee's popularity as to the credit of the soldier, who, tradition has it, subsequently fell mortally wounded in action, the last survivor at his gun. Instead of blaming Lee for their hunger, the troops felt he was struggling with the administration in their interest, and their reverent affection for him grew daily. His theory, expressed upon many occasions, wrote an officer who saw him frequently during the winter, was that the private soldiers, men who fought without the stimulus of rank, emolument, or individual renown, were the most meritorious class of the army, and that they deserved and should receive the utmost respect and consideration. He vetoed a plan for a battalion of honor because he did not believe it could contain all the men who had distinguished themselves, and to every private who appealed to him he gave a sympathetic hearing. One day he saw a man in uniform standing near his tent. Come in, captain, he said, and take a seat. I'm no captain, general, the soldier replied. I'm nothing but a private. Come in, sir, Lee replied, come in and take a seat. You ought to be a captain. That was Lee's attitude. Officers and men alike requited it with a confidence that was half of victory. It does not seem possible to defeat this army now with General Lee at its head, a surgeon wrote. Later, the same observant man told his wife, you need have no apprehension that this army will ever meet with defeat while commanded by General Lee. General Jackson is a strict Presbyterian, but he is rather too much of a Napoleon Bonaparte in my estimation. Lee is the man, I assure you. <laughs>
A private wrote long afterwards, it was remarkable what confidence the men reposed in General Lee, they were ready to follow him wherever he might lead, or order them to go. In this spirit, during a march that was as tempestuous as February, the army passed through a series of alarms and preparations, while Hooker kept his balloons in the air as if he were expecting an attack. An expedition into northwest Virginia by two columns to burn bridges on the B and O, and to collect supplies was made ready with much interchange of correspondence between the chiefs of the cooperating forces, and a change of commanders in the Valley District had to be considered at the instance of the War Department. Attention to these details was interrupted by a call to Richmond for consultation with the President on the military situation. This visit, like that in January, was ended by a report that the enemy was massing cavalry, this time at Kelly's Ford. Assuming that this was the beginning of a general offensive, Lee ordered Longstreet's detached divisions to rejoin, but when he reached headquarters on the 18th, he found that the enemy had not attempted to move any infantry across the river and had withdrawn his cavalry after a spectacular battle between 300 Federal horse and Fitz Lee's mounted brigade. A fire from rifle pits along the river had somewhat delayed the Federal crossing, and the Confederate cavalry had worsted superior forces with much gallantry. The victory, however, had been dearly bought in the death of Major John Pelham of the Stuart Horse Artillery, probably the most promising artillery officer in the entire army, with the single exception of E. P. Alexander. Lee cancelled the order for the movement of Hood and Pickett and joined with the rest of his forces in mourning the knightly scion of a southern home who dazzled the land with deeds. The wise employment of Longstreet's force, thus left undisturbed south of the James, was becoming a matter of serious moment to Lee. By the detachment of the two divisions of the Second Corps, his strength had been dangerously reduced. The return of convalescence and lightly wounded did not raise his army in the middle of March above 63,000, including Jones's cavalry in the valley. Longstreet had 44,000 effectives in his department, which was shortly afterward enlarged, under Lee's general supervision, to include the Richmond area, Virginia south of the James, and the whole of North Carolina. The force opposing Longstreet was not accurately known but was estimated to be about equal to his own. Obviously, if Longstreet had opportunity of striking at the Federals, he might reasonably hope to defeat them. But was it wise to force the fighting on that front? In attempting to answer that question, Lee had to take two facts into account. First, he could not afford to permit Longstreet to move Hood and Pickett too far from the railroad, because if Hooker advanced on the Rappahannock, Lee might require them speedily. In the second place, the Army of Northern Virginia badly needed supplies, and if it was able to assume the offensive, it must have a reserve of food. Longstreet, as it happened, was within reach of eastern North Carolina, where a large volume of provisions, especially of bacon, was known to be available, but could only be collected with army wagons. Which meant more to the cause, a commissary campaign by Longstreet or a military campaign at a time when Lee might have desperate need of the best units of Longstreet's command? It was a difficult choice. Lee sought to adjust the use of Longstreet's troops to all contingencies. He desired Hood and Pickett held as a reserve either to support Longstreet, if that officer could take the offensive, or to rejoin the Army of Northern Virginia should their presence become necessary. Meantime, Longstreet was to employ his force to collect all supplies within that part of his department where the enemy seemed to be weak. Lee wrote Longstreet on March 16 that one corps, and not three, as previously reported, had left the Rappahannock front. He concluded, as our numbers will not admit of our meeting, the enemy, on equality everywhere, we much endeavor, by judicious dispositions, to be enabled to make our troops available in any quarter where they may be needed, and, after the emergency passes in one place to transfer them to any other point that may be threatened. Longstreet was of little assistance to his chief in making a wise decision as to the employment of his troops. He professed a desire to attack, but he was on his first independent command, and his habitual caution battled with his vanity and his desire to win a victory. He interpreted the restraining orders on Pickett and Hood as a bar to action, and in a wordy correspondence with Lee, repeatedly asked for more men as a prerequisite to taking the offensive and collecting the supplies. With long-range cocksureness, he expressed conviction that Lee could hold Hooker on the Rappahannock or, if need be, could advantageously withdraw to the North Anna in order to let him have additional troops. Lee did not feel that at so great a distance from Longstreet's lines he could insist on a definite plan.
Almost despairing of substantial results in Southside, Virginia, he left the case to Longstreet's discretion, though urging an offensive. He dismissed the appeal for more regiments with the statement that if he were further weakened, he would have to withdraw to the line of the Annas, which he considered undesirable for reasons he took pains to explain. While this correspondence was progressing, General Lee received, on March 28, a report that Burnside's IX Corps was moving westward by rail, presumably to Kentucky. At first, Lee was not disposed to credit this report, but inquiry convinced him by April 1 that it was well-founded. Now, Burnside's Corps had been at Newport News. The reinforcement it had afforded the Federals in southern Virginia and North Carolina had been the principal reason for dispatching two of Longstreet's divisions to that section. If, therefore, Longstreet had been deterred from attacking because of the strength of the enemy in fortified positions, the withdrawal of Burnside greatly bettered Longstreet's prospects. But the solution was not as simple as that. Larger strategic considerations had to be weighed. Kentucky at that time was lightly held by the Federals, chiefly to protect the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, which formed the chief line of communications with General Rosecrans's army, then around Murfreesboro, Tennessee General John Pegram and General Humphrey Marshall were raiding in Kentucky, chiefly for provisions. Any large dispatch of federal troops to the Ohio not only would put a quietus on these raids, but might mean the reinforcement of Rosecrans, whose odds against the Confederate Army under Bragg it was important the enemy should not be allowed to increase. How, then, could the Army of Northern Virginia prevent the dispatch of more troops from the Army of the Potomac to the Western Front? If Longstreet could strike, that might prove a diversion, if Longstreet reinforced Lee, then as soon as the weather permitted, Lee could draw Hooker out and perhaps so threaten Washington that all troop movement westward would stop. In any case, if Longstreet's two absent divisions rejoined the Army of Northern Virginia, then Lee would be able to make a better resistance and, if he gained a victory, to follow it up. The involvements were thus of the greatest moment to the whole Confederate cause. At this juncture, when a right decision on Lee's part might affect the outcome of the war, the fates that had so often conspired against the Confederacy at critical hours again intervened on the side of the Union. For the first time during the war, and for the first time since he had been at Sollers Point in 1849, Lee fell ill. He had not been sleeping well, and in some way he contracted a serious throat infection which settled into what seems to have been a pericarditis. His arm, his chest, and his back were attacked with sharp paroxysms of pain that suggest even the possibility of an angina. On March 30th, he had to be moved from his bleak winter quarters to Yerby's and put under the care of the medical director of the army, Dr. Lafayette Guild. When Guild was himself taken sick, Lee was attended by Dr. S. M. Bemis, a distinguished New Orleans physician, then a surgeon with the forces. Lee's illness kept him in bed for some days, with the doctors, as he said, tapping me all over like an old steam boiler before condemning it. The weather, which was worse in early April than at any time during the winter, contributed to keeping him a captive. His first impulse was to have Longstreet take to offensive against the diminished forces in his front while he drove the Federal cavalry from the valley and thereby played once more on Mr. Lincoln's fears for the safety of Washington. But the roads made immediate operations in the valley impossible, and in view of Longstreet's representations of the strong earthworks of the enemy on his front, Lee did not feel able to do more than once again to trust to Longstreet's discretion. You are, he wrote Longstreet at the beginning of his illness, relieved of half the force that has been opposed to you. You will therefore be strong enough to make any movement that you may consider advisable, but, as stated in former letters, so long as the enemy choose to remain on the defensive and covered by their entrenchments and floating batteries I fear you can accomplish but little, except to draw provisions from the invaded districts. If you can accomplish this, it will be of positive benefit. I leave the whole matter to your good judgment. On April 6, after Lee's sickness had begun to abate somewhat, the Secretary of War sounded him out on something that meant even more than the detention of Hood and Pickett in southern Virginia, would it be possible, the Secretary asked, to dispatch part of Longstreet's command to Tennessee to reinforce Bragg? This question was put when Longstreet was still calling for more troops, and when threatening demonstrations against Charleston led to the belief that the forces at Wilmington, N.C., would have to be reduced to reinforce that city. Lee was willing, as always, to release troops if the demand in Tennessee was greater than elsewhere, but, sick as he was, he put forward a bolder plan, on April 9, a date that was to be black with woe in 1865, he wrote the Secretary of War, should Hooker's army assume the defensive, 
The readiest method of relieving the pressure upon General Johnston and General Beauregard would be for this army to cross into Maryland. This cannot be done, however, in the present condition of the roads, nor unless I can obtain a certain amount of provisions and transportation. But this is what I would recommend, if practicable. He went on to explain what Longstreet was doing in the collection of supplies in North Carolina. Longstreet, he said, does not think he has troops enough for the purpose, and has applied for more of his corps to be sent to him, which I have not thought advisable to do. If any of his troops are taken from him, I fear it will arrest his operations and deprive us of the benefit anticipated from increasing the supplies of the army. I must, therefore, submit your proposition to the determination of yourself and the President. Meantime, to prepare for eventualities, he called for pontoons to be employed in crossing rivers if he took the offensive. A week passed. Lee's symptoms moderated still more and he suffered no discomfort except from occasional twinges of what his physicians considered rheumatism, but his condition was enfeebled and he had to take more rest, which the enemy seemed little disposed to allow him. The Federal cavalry was active. There were rumors that Hooker was planning to duplicate McClellan's great maneuver of March, 1862, and transport his army to the James. Lee did not credit this camp gossip because he did not believe the enemy would uncover Washington. Expecting the campaign to open in northern Virginia, he made his preparations to carry out the plan he had outlined to Seddon. If Hooker did not seize the initiative before May 1, Lee intended first to sweep Milroy from the valley. Then, with the provisions he hoped could be accumulated there by the projected raid into northwestern Virginia, he intended to carry the war again into Maryland in the hope of relieving thereby the pressure on the other Confederate armies. But there was one immediate difficulty. Even to move the army on the first leg of its advance toward the Potomac, Lee must have the supplies from North Carolina, and to collect those supplies, Longstreet must be kept there as long as practicable. This was the reasoning that led him, at the last, to leave Longstreet south of the James and to take the risk of facing Hooker with inferior forces if the Federal commander assumed the offensive. That risk increased hourly, for the Federal cavalry remained on a wide front. They displayed so much more strength and energy than during the campaign of 1862 that Lee renewed applications he had made earlier in the winter to the President for an increase in his own mounted troops. Lee took the demonstration of the cavalry to mean that Hooker was trying to draw him to the upper Rappahannock in the hope of discovering his strength or of throwing his pontoons across the river and seizing Fredericksburg. For a few days thereafter, all was quiet. The Federals kept their balloons in the air, continually, and seemed to be expecting rather than preparing an offensive. Then, on the 23d, evidence began to multiply that Hooker had no intention of waiting until Lee could take the situation in his own hands after Longstreet had collected his bacon and had rejoined the army. A raid was made on Port Royal on April 23. It ended with the return of the Federals to the north bank of the river before they could be assailed, but it was a suspicious affair. Lee took it to be a feint, a warning that the campaign was soon to open, and he notified the troops on the Confederate left to be on the alert, for, he told Jackson, I think if a real attempt is made to cross the river, it will be above Fredericksburg. Stewart reported a concentration of Federal cavalry on the upper Rappahannock a few days later and spies informed Lee that all the troops in rear of Hooker's lines had been brought up. Lee watched every development intently. He was satisfied that if Hooker delayed until the army could be reunited, he could defeat him. Should he attempt such a movement when the army is able to operate, he said in characteristically unboastful language, I think he will find it very difficult to reach his destination. But with the army divided, the horses feeble and provisions low, he doubted his ability even to act on the defensive, to quote his words, as vigorously as circumstances may require. Still, when Longstreet reported that he was getting all the provisions out of North Carolina as rapidly as possible, the bacon of that state seemed so important to the half-starved army that Lee merely inquired how soon Longstreet could finish his task and rejoin. Sunday morning, April 28, Lee went with Jackson to a religious service, attended by a throng of soldiers, and during the afternoon, he went to call on Mrs. Jackson, who was visiting at Yerby's. That evening, on both sides of the Rappahannock, regimental adjutants were beginning to put together the returns of the personnel of the army, due on the 30th, Hooker's officers had a magnificent total to compile, 138,378 present for duty.
spies reports and a study of the incautious northern newspapers had led the Confederate Signal Corps to believe that the number was as high as 150,000 to 160,000, a figure that Lee thought much exaggerated. His own strength cannot be stated with absolute certainty, as events were to prevent the completion of the returns, but the total, excluding Jones's little force of cavalry in the Shenandoah Valley, was not much, if any, in excess of 62,500 of all arms, less than half the force's powerful adversary commanded. Except on the day before the Battle of Sharpsburg, he had never faced such crushing odds, yet he had been planning to take the offensive if Hooker did not. Before daybreak on the morning of April 29th, Lee was aroused by a distant roll that he took to be gunfire, but he was overtaken again by drowsiness and was soon asleep once more. Presently, he was awakened by someone calling his name. Opening his eyes, he saw the grave face of Jackson's aide, Captain James Power Smith, bending over him. Captain, said he teasingly, what do you young men mean by waking a man out of his sleep? In a few soldierly words Smith announced that Jackson had sent him to inform the general that under cover of the fog hooker had thrown his pontoons and was crossing the Rappahannock in force. Well, said Lee, I thought I heard firing and was beginning to think it was time some of you young fellows were coming to tell me what it was all about. You want me to send a message to your good general, Captain? Tell him that I am sure he knows what to do. I will meet him at the front very soon. It was dawn, but it was close to the high noon of the Confederacy.